everyone could please take a seat. We're ready to get started. Oh, great. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to, um, to the Spring Conference of Brookings Papers on Economic Activity. Uh, my name is John Steinson, and Janice Eberly and I are the editors of Brookings Papers on Economic Activity. Um, before I get the program started, I just wanted to cover a few bases. Um, one is to remind everybody that this is a recorded event and it's live streamed on the internet. Um, a second thing I wanted to say is that for those of you that are participating with us on Zoom, um, during the Q&A, you're welcome to uh, participate and ask questions. I ask you to uh, raise your hand in Zoom and, and we'll try to call on you. Um, uh, third, I'd like to introduce um, Shannon Murat, who's uh, Interim Managing Director of uh, Economic Studies at Brookings, who would like to say a few words. Thank you, John. I'll be very brief. Make sure you can hear me. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. Um, as John mentioned, I'm Shannon. I'm the Interim Managing Director for the Economic Studies Program. I'd just like to briefly welcome you all to this two-day conference for the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity. First, I'd like to thank the editors, Jan, John. Uh, thank you for assembling a terrific slate of papers. Um, I'd also like to thank the generous supporters who make this BPA conference and the journal possible. So thank you to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, General Motors Company, the National Science Foundation, and State Farm Mutual Automobile Insurance Company. We also gratefully acknowledge Jason Cummins and the Brevenhauer Research Services for supporting BPA's mission and activities. We express appreciation to Dina Axelrod Perry for establishing the George L. Perry and William C. Brainerd BPA Chair. On that note, thank you all. Enjoy the conference. Okay, without further ado, I think we should just get into the first paper. So the first paper is on why we dislike inflation, and it's by Stephanie Stancheva. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be on the program and see so many, uh, so many faces. So this is a paper that basically tries to revisit uh, a key paper by Robert Schiller from the 90s which was asking exactly this question, why do people dislike inflation? And his findings, you know, in a nutshell back then were that people worry about their living standards and they associate inflation with bad outcomes. But lots has changed since the 90s. Um, lots of time has passed, so it's time to perhaps revisit this question. Have these views changed with all these economic changes? And so the goal of this paper is to update our understanding of people's perceptions of inflation using you know, the advances in survey methods that have been done since then. Today we can get you know, larger samples, very representative samples. Uh, we can look at heterogeneity across different groups, for instance, by political leaning or by income. And so this is the goal here of this paper. So I'll dive straight into uh, what I'm doing. So very concretely, this is going to be based on two surveys. They do different things. The first survey is a more standard, let's call it structured survey, with closed-ended questions. So people will be asked about various things, um, their demographics, their definition of inflation, their views on past inflation and expectations, their personal impacts of inflation. And here we have to think of people in several roles. People can be consumers, people can be workers, people can be asset holders, and there's also, let's say, a psychological perhaps, or emotional impact of inflation. And then for all these uh, margins, there's also possible reactions, responses that people can have. So I'll ask them, how did you react as a consumer, as a worker, in great detail. And then a part that I'm not going to focus on much today, um, it's on policy views, just what do people want 
to be done on inflation. I'll be quite brief on that. The survey B, which is covering the same topics, has a different approach, which is very open-ended questions. So these are questions where you don't provide respondents with a given set of options, but instead let them write freely. The advantage of that is that you don't prime people. Perhaps you know people have other things in mind than we economists. And you can analyze these answers with text analysis methods, for instance, to extract topics, which is what I'll show you here. So the results that I'll show you um, will be split in different groups. So sometimes the most interesting heterogeneity is by income. So I'll show you a split between lower income and higher income respondents. But sometimes the most interesting one is by political leaning. And so then I'll emphasize that one. I have a you know, very comprehensive set of graphs and tables in the paper. There's definitely things by age, uh, by race, by gender, et cetera. But I want to emphasize income and political leaning today. So we can talk more about the sample itself maybe during the Q&A. It's broadly representative of the US population. So try to think of it as a broad uh, you know, sample of, of people. So what I want to cover first is a brief, you know, a brief description of people's understanding of inflation, very, very basic level, their expectations and their interest in inflation. And then I'll go towards their personal impacts and reactions and end up with policy views. So the first, um, the first thing is how do people define inflation? I hope you can, you can read at least some of the answers here. Uh, is it too small? So I'll read a few. So there is, um, this is an open-ended question, you know, how do you define inflation? And I've grouped things in what I call relatively correct and relatively incorrect. The relative is there because very, very few people give the exact definition we might expect. But people will say things, you know, inflation is when prices go up over time. I describe inflation as increase in prices across the country. It's an increase in the price of goods. This is relatively accurate. Relatively incorrect are things like Price gouging, especially for the greedy, by raising prices so high, or not being able to afford to live, these are more incorrect definitions. If you put people in front of a simple calculation, like these are prices today, these are prices tomorrow, what is the inflation rate, 85% will get it right. So in simple settings, people understand the, the calculation, but when they speak freely, it's not necessarily the definition we have in mind. And then there was a question in Robert Schiller's work, which was very interesting, which is, do you view inflation merely as a yardstick, as a unit of measurement? Very few people agree with that, only around 40%. In terms of expectations and perceptions of inflation, so this graph shows you on the left the perception of the past inflation over the last 12 months. And then on the right, it's the expected inflation. And what we can see is that people slightly overestimate the inflation that has happened. So the mean perception is 7%, the median is 5%. So there's a overinflation, in a sense, in people's minds of, of what has happened. Similarly, people tend to expect, you know, similar inflation that has happened slightly lower for the next 12 months. And there's some interesting heterogeneities here. So higher income people will tend to perceive both lower past inflation and lower expected inflation. Republican respondents, female respondents, and black respondents actually over-perceive inflation even more that has happened and have higher expectations for the future. And if you ask people which items have increased most in prices, the ones they'll list is first and foremost food, followed by gas, rent, and utilities. So when you ask people a question that was also in Schiller, which is, try to tell me why news on inflation are interesting. Why would you find it interesting? Typically, people will say things like, it impacts everybody. Um, and there's no big heterogeneity here by income or anything. Or it conveys information. To some extent, it, it helps planning. And lots of people report paying more attention to inflation now than before, with the main source of news being you know, official news being TV, followed by newspapers and social media. But actually, uh, if you ask in a non-priming way, where do people get their info from, they will say that it's mainly recent purchases. So it's the grocery prices that they see or the purchases that they make, much more so than official statistics or news. And one thing that I want to cover briefly is the people's perceived causes and consequences of inflation, understandably very quickly. And here I think the most interesting heterogeneities are by political leaning. So if you look at open-ended answers that you classify into topics, 
how inflation is caused by, you know, empty text box. What do people say? You see that on the Republican side, it's going to be a lot Biden and the administration. The answers are typically things like Joe Biden, uh, the government, the current government, so very clearly um, in that direction. Among Democrats, a much more common topic is greed. So that comes out a lot as it relates to corporations, uh, sometimes to politicians, but mainly to corporations. Monetary policy, fiscal policy, war and foreign policy, Demand versus supply, some people truly mention things like when demand is too high relative to supply. Um, they're not all econ majors either. Um, supply side mechanisms, energy prices. So those are the things that people have in mind. COVID-19 is a super small reason. So this is something that very, very few people will mention uh, as, a, as a main cause of inflation. In terms of the consequences, what do people worry about if there's high inflation? You know, the most common one, and here the heterogeneity is interesting by income, is very much financial hardship, especially among, among low incomes. Um, a recession is a worry among higher incomes, much less so among lower income respondents. And then if you ask people, are there any positive consequences from inflation, most people will say no, none. You know, it's, it's can't think of any. And then if people try to find some, it will be things like, oh, it forces people to budget, et cetera. It's not at all the trade-offs we have in mind, and I'll come back to this at the end. There's lots of perceived political and social consequences from inflation. This echoes uh, Schiller's original paper in terms of people think it hurts international reputation, it decreases social stability, it can decrease social cohesion. So overall, lots of negative stuff no trade-off, no potential redeeming positive impacts. So let's turn a little bit into, into the question of wages because that's something that's clearly top of mind for people. So if you ask people, you know, why do wages change? Why do employers adjust wages? Schiller offers people three different theories and I wanted to see if people still think the same way. So the three theories are essentially you know, inflation will increase my employer profit, but you will not feel the need to increase my pay. So that's the major reason that people, you know, give. Lots of people agree with that statement. Fewer people agree with increased competition will force my employer to, like, increase my wages. And then fewer people agree with a sense of fairness and proper behavior will cause my employer to raise my pay. So in a nutshell, people seem to think firms have considerable discretion in setting wages rather than being subject to only market forces. Um, and that's actually very reminiscent of what people were saying in the 90s, that employers can sort of choose the wages they set. And if they don't adjust them, it's by choice. Let me jump to the personal impact um, of inflation and their reactions to inflation. So first, in a very open-ended way, if you ask people what's been the most important impact of inflation in your life, the cost of living will be you know, the top thing. Um, without priming people in terms of in your job or in your consumption, this is what people will mention. And you see that it's mainly uh, happening among lower income respondents. They are going to say concrete things like it's harder to, avoid, to afford food or gas, so necessities that's going to be especially among lower income respondents. And then if we dive successively into, well, what about the consumption? What about as a worker? What about as an asset holder? This is all, you know, in the paper. Let me just give you a few key results here. So first, as a consumer, what we see is that, yes, people think purchasing power has decreased. That's the, the major consequence that people expect. To some extent, people also think shrinkflation, defined as you know, things becoming uh, smaller or lower quality, but for the same price, is also prevalent. Uh, some people think comparison shopping has become harder, but this is a really interesting case where in the 90s, this was a major concern. We can't compare prices as well anymore. So is it the case that technology today actually makes this less of an issue? Uh, very few people mention that it's now harder to shop or compare prices. So that could be an evolution of technology. And you know, across the board in general, for all these impacts, it will be lower income respondents that will be most affected. I then ask people, you know, as consumers, what they have done to react to this. And there's lots of possible reactions, so this is a really really big figure, let me just point out two things, which is first, low income respondents will always 
say, oh, I had to cut consumption, I had to reduce the quality, I had to you know, postpone purchases. So it will be much more among lower income respondents. The other thing is that contrary to what we may think, very few people say they're going to accelerate purchases today because of inflation or stockpile. That is basically non-existent. Most people say, oh, I'm going to delay or postpone. As workers, there's also really interesting impact. So let me point out two. One is, if you ask people if the inflation doubled, how long would it take for your wage to keep up with it? You know, lots of people will think it will take more than a year. Yet, this is better than in the 90s. So in the 90s, very few people thought inflation would sort of ever be compensated for by wages. So there was a much more pessimistic view than today on that. And then people are much less worried in general about the work impacts than about the consumption impacts. And if you look at the bottom, most people agree very strongly that prices rise much faster than wages, and especially the wages of, low, of high income respondents rise faster to keep, keep up with inflation than everyone else's. So there's a sense of inequality that might be fostered by inflation, where high income, respondent, high income people are much more likely to catch up with the prices rather than low income people. I'll skip the impacts as an asset holder. If you're interested, you know, I ask people about their savings, their mortgage, um, their debt behaviors. And in the interest of time, I'll show you just a little bit on the psychological impacts of inflation. So this will be quite clear. So I'm showing you just the word cloud. When I hear rising inflation, I feel these are the words that come up. So um, there's a lot of anger, anxiety, fear, sadness. So it's, it's overwhelmingly negative emotions. And then if you ask people, you know, who, do, who are you angry at um, when there's inflation, it's again between the government, the business, and then to some extent the system overall. These are open-ended questions, so this is what people write, you know, without being, without being primed. So let me switch to um, the policy views super briefly. And the one thing I want to emphasize, and this is very much related to Carola's work and, and what other people have shown, it's that... There's a complete lack of perceived trade-off. So inflation is like a bad thing that happens, and there's nothing redeeming for it. So for instance, if you ask people, you know, how are inflation and unemployment correlated, very few will say they're negatively related. Most people will say, yes, they are related. They're positively related. And what is, what is inflation indicating? People will say it's a poor state of the economy. So there is very much a lack of any sort of redeeming factor or perceived trade-off or constraints that policymakers might be facing. So let me just summarize here. Um, inflation is definitely not seen as a yardstick, but rather as causing really tangible adverse effects. And if there's one, question, one answer to the question, why do we dislike inflation, it's because people think wages don't keep up with prices, and so purchasing power and living standards decline. That might be a surprise to no one except us economists, where we're like, but what about shoe leather costs? What about resource allocation? But that's not top of mind. It's clearly there, but it's not the top of mind reason that people have. And this is amplified very much by the belief that employers you know, can adjust wages if they want it, but don't. Um, and one thing I didn't show you here is that if you ask people the reasons for their wage increases, even in inflationary periods, they're going to say, oh, it's job performance its career progression rather than attributed to inflationary adjustments. So that compounds the feeling that wages don't keep up. All the effects are much more pronounced among lower incomes. And in addition to that, people think that overall higher income people are much more able to keep up with inflation. And that causes inequality feelings and stress and emotional responses. And then the people who are blamed for it is typically government and businesses. This buzzword that is clearly there in people's mind, which is greed, is there. And then the trade-offs are really that we economists think about are really not very salient. I've put to be continued here because I'm working on another paper where I'm actually really drilling into that. And what if you actually provide people with information about those trade-offs? As a spoiler, it seems to do nothing. So it's very hard to explain those trade-offs at all. And so despite you know, lots of improvements in survey methodology and changes in the economic environment, the very core findings of Schiller are really still relevant today. Um, and there's these new interesting findings you know, on emotions, on different adjustment margins, and on political polarization that appears here too. So thank you very much. Our first discussant is Carola Binder.
Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie, and to everyone at Brookings for inviting me to present this paper. It's really um, an honor to get to discuss it. Um, so in 1997, when Robert Schiller conducted his survey of inflation attitudes, um, the countries around the world had only recently undergone high unemployment and low output growth as part of an effort to bring inflation down from very high levels. And there was a pretty wide consensus that this trade-off was necessary, but the consensus was actually um, kind of puzzling. So economists tended to model the welfare costs of inflation as coming from the real tax that it imposed on the tax that it imposed on real money balances, which would be measured as the um, area under the money demand function, corresponding to a deadweight loss of moving from um, a lower to a higher inflation rate. And these costs were small um, to the extent that in their textbook, Blanchard and Fisher said that standard characterizations of the policymaker's objective function put more weight on the cost of inflation than is suggested by our understanding of the effects of inflation. And they suggested that you know, this might be reflecting other, other types of costs, like coming from political realities. So what Schiller wanted to do was um, pretty unorthodox for an economist at the time. It was just to ask people about their, um, their preferences and their beliefs. He surveyed consumers in the U.S. and Germany and Brazil, so three different kind of inflation environments, and found that they believed that inflation eroded their standard of living. They believed that controlling inflation was one of the most important goals of economic policy. And they even said they would prefer 10 years of 2% inflation and 9% unemployment over 10 years of 10% monthly inflation and 3% unemployment. Now, this kind of hypothetical trade-off may have been too extreme to really be useful. And actually, um, Christina and David Romer, who edited the MBER volume in which Schiller's work appeared, said what we didn't really have was evidence about um, the costs and benefits of reducing inflation from something like 3% to 1%. Greg Mankiw, who was um, Schiller's discussant, said that I'm not at all sure in what direction Schiller's results should push either economic theory or economic policy. Okay. So now we're almost two decades later, one high inflation episode later, um, and Stancheva has surveyed U.S. consumers and finds that they still dislike inflation because they still think that it diminishes their buying power. Um, they don't recognize positive associations with inflation, and they rank it really high among um, you know, their, their rankings of economic and social problems. So like Schiller, she doesn't really um, explicitly talk about the policy implications of this work, um, but they're certainly going to be at the front of mind for any reader, so especially that idea of the policymaker's objective function. And Readers might be a little puzzled thinking about what these results should actually or could actually mean for questions like, you know, does consumers' reported distaste for inflation justify putting more weight on inflation in the objective function or lowering the inflation target? Or questions like, in the next recession, recession should policymakers be more cautious in their fiscal and monetary response? So in thinking through this kind of question, um, I want to talk about what happened in between the time of Schiller's and Stancheva's survey, and in particular about following the Great Recession. Um, in 2012, when the Fed announced their inflation target, they promised to take a balanced approach in pursuing their price stability and maximum employment mandate. At the time, inflation was below the target, the labor market recovered only slowly from the recession, and it took until the end of 2015 until unemployment got down to 5%. At that point, the Fed um, raised rates off of the zero lower bound, even though inflation was still below target, in anticipation that inflation would start to rise. And this um, preemptive tightening actually got a lot of criticism, um, mostly from, well, for example, this is the, the Fed Up Coalition, which was um, a coalition of mostly left-leaning and progressive think tanks and consumer advocacy groups and labor unions. And they really argued against the Fed tightening, saying that the costs of inflation were not that bad and that they didn't nearly offset um, or outweigh the benefits of full employment. And the reasoning was actually quite influential. Um, so as part of the Fed's framework review in 2019 and 2020, they conducted a series of listening events called Fed Listens. And in the Fed Listens report, it says that you know, the people they talked to said they didn't really dislike inflation. Um, they even said that inflation might be too low. 
Younger participants noted that their generation is more concerned with another recession than with high inflation. And to really kind of hammer home the, the idea that inflation was an old people problem, they said the biggest fear, this was in the report, the be- biggest fear of the older adult is not death, it's running out of money. But, you know, the younger people, they don't mind inflation. Um, and, and this was, I mean, they, they did pay attention to these listening sessions. So after the framework review, the Fed amended its um, framework and adopted average inflation targeting. And their new framework was deliberately asymmetric. They promised to make up for undershoots of the inflation target, but not, um, not for overshoots. So the Fed listened when people said that they didn't dislike inflation so much. And of course, this wasn't the first time. I mean, our monetary institutions owe a lot to how much people dislike deflation. Um, when we had the gold standard, right, that limited the ability of having big sustained inflations, but it also sometimes required deflation, which was um, really unpopular, especially among um, farmers, because it increased the real debt burden. So by the time of William Jennings Bryan, you have politicians, populist politicians, saying that what we actually need is monetary expansion and inflation because that's what the people want and that's what will help the people. Um, So, you know, now we have our monetary institutions that are designed to give policymakers the power and the discretion to create some inflation if they choose. And in fact, we have to have central bank independence because otherwise the body politic is... Um, you know, they like inflation so much in the short run that they'll pick inflationary policies to their own long-run detriment. Um, But the idea of constraining policymakers even more tightly in in the interest of preventing inflation altogether is really really unpopular. So this is all kind of puzzling. It's like, why do people um, report on this recent survey they dislike inflation, and what should we make of these survey results? Um, I'm going to go back again to 1997 um, in Mankiw's discussion of Schiller. Well, he noted that Schiller had also surveyed economists. The economists, um, what was, how they were different than the layman, is the layman thought that inflation made them poorer. And Mankiw advised that we should resist the temptation to snicker at, um, at laymen for not being good economists. Um, Sancheva did not also survey economists, but I think we should still like, resist this temptation. Um, if you look just at real wage growth versus inflation, they are very negatively correlated. Um, it makes sense for people to kind of think that inflation is associated with bad outcomes, especially if some of the inflation comes from supply shocks. And when they're asked questions like, how would you describe the relation between inflation and unemployment? The only options are um, when inflation is higher, unemployment is higher, or when inflation is higher, unemployment is lower. We, um, you know, as an economist, I think we really need an it depends option because it depends on the shocks. Um, as a regular person, if I could be one, I would say that this looks more like a cloud than a line. So we still, you know, it's still not clear what would be like a correct answer for a person to pick. Um, yeah, and even if we're not thinking about what kinds of shocks are hitting the economy, I think people can reasonably interpret the survey questions as asking them to think about the Cedars Paribus effects of inflation. So when they're asked about, um, does it reduce your purchasing power? Does it make you more stressed? They're not asked to think about counterfactuals. So I would just interpret this as all else equal. And all else equal, you know, more inflation does mean lower purchasing power, and more stress, and so on. Um, I think some of the questions are a little bit, um, maybe the wording might be difficult for people to interpret. Like, if inflation doubled, how long until your wage doubles? Um, This inflation doubling, like, from 4% to 8%, my wage is, like, a number of dollars, and I don't think that's hardly ever going to double, so I think it's not too surprising to say that it um, will take a long time. Um, Finally, this is a pretty long survey. I think it takes people around half an hour to complete, and almost all of the questions are about inflation and its costs. So I think that um, leaves room for a lot of priming and experiment or demand effects. By the time people are asked to rank their um, economic policy priorities or their social policy priorities, they've been thinking about inflation for a long time, and it kind of makes sense that they're going to rank um, inflation really high on the list. If they had been asked about like healthcare um, or unemployment for most of the survey, they might have ranked that higher. Um, yeah. So one of the one of the conclusions was that people scarcely acknowledge any positive impacts from inflation. 
And in a way, they're right. Like inflation doesn't inherently have positive impacts, but stabilizing aggregate demand, which sometimes requires allowing temporarily higher inflation, that does have positive impacts. So that means that inflation is often a side effect of policies that people do like, such as fiscal stimulus and a pandemic. And it's reasonable for people to report that they dislike the side effect, even if they would like the counterfactual even more. It's hard to ask them about that because they don't really know what the counterfactual is, and that's actually where you know we as economists need to come in and try to understand that. Um, it's also really reasonable for people to strongly dislike and for the media to fixate on inflation that results from actual or perceived policy errors, and that's also where you know as economists um, we have a, a role to play. Um, so, yeah. I do think that this is a really exciting paper. Um, I think it's a great new data set. There's like so much that can be done with it. So I hope a lot of other researchers can use it. I hope it will prompt replication in other countries and other macroeconomic environments. And um, I'll end there, but thank you all very much. Our second discussion is Yuri Gorodnichenko. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for inviting me to discuss this terrific paper. It is really, truly a reality check uh, for economists interested in understanding how people think about inflation and how they interpret inflation and how they uh, learn about inflation and how they potentially form inflation expectations. Um, it, it's really kind of the view from the trenches, and this is a great value added of this paper. Um, now, Greg Menkew, in his discussion of uh, Schiller's paper, was saying that economists are not people, right? And he said that, you know, they have very different views of inflation and what this means in terms of actions. And just to underscore this point, you know, if you take any uh, textbook, uh, mainstream textbook in macroeconomics, for example, I use Menkew and Blanchard in my instruction, um, you know, you go to the discussion of inflation and you typically see this, you know, costs of inflation. It's misallocation of resources, it's some type of uh, tax distortion, um, it's some arbitrary distribution. Uh, we also have a discussion of positive effects from inflation, that it can reduce inflation. And there's also a discussion of what inflation is not doing for us. For example, we know in the long run, at least for moderately low levels of inflation, uh, inflation does not affect real wages in the economy, right? So that's a misconception. Now, you go to households, and this is, you know, what you see clearly from uh, Stephanie's work, is that people have very different views, right? So you ask them about the costs of inflation, none of the standard costs we mentioned in the textbook are going to be on their radar. They're not talking about price dispersion, they're not talking about redistribution, none of that stuff. Uh, what they are talking about is this misconception that somehow inflation is affecting their real wages, their purchasing power. So it's kind of striking that we have a problem there. Also, they see zero benefits from inflation. They say, you know, inflation is not doing anything good for us. Okay? So it's not lowering unemployment. There is really no reason why we should have inflation. Now, this is on costs and benefits. You see this in other ways, for example, on uh, what causes inflation. And, you know, even in economics, we have disagreements about what exactly causes inflation. Is this, you know, money that is, you know, creating inflation, or is this is fiscal imbalances? But, you know, this quote from Friedman is, is sort of a natural starting point, that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Now, you go and see what people say uh, about causes of inflation, and, you know, there is government mentioned there, but it's in a very general form where it's not you know, a specific branch of the government, it's not the Fed, it's not the central bank, it's not Ben Bernanke or you know, Alan Greenspan or anybody like that. Um, so it's just you know, some stuff there that is happening, but it's not really a monetary policy. Now, Stephanie you know, briefly touched on this. You know, in this unstructured questions, people can write all sorts of funny things. Uh, at least from my experience of looking at those questions. And you know, maybe you want to give them a little bit more structure, give an opportunity to pick monetary policy or fiscal policy as a source of inflation. And we know from other work, even if you kind of help people you know, think about these issues, you put this option on the table, very few people pick fiscal and monetary policy as the source of inflation. 
they would say, well, it's all about costs, you know, energy, gas prices, food, but it's never about the Fed or its treasury, none, none of this, really. So this is telling us that, you know, economists are not people, you know, people are not economists. Um, and we want to understand that what they think about inflation, and this is what comes out from Stephanie's work. First, that inflation is really a bad state of the world, right? This is the time when unemployment is high, and this is what people really, really dislike. We also see that people have this very partial equilibrium view of the world. Inflation goes up, you know, wages are going down. Uh, they don't think about general equilibrium effects that wages at some point are going to catch up, this kind of sense. None of this is really happening for them. We also see that they think inflation is basically a zero-sum game, that it's a conflict. You know, you take resources from one group of people and give it to another group of people. It may be from households to firms or somebody else, but it's a conflict, right? There is no general benefit for everybody when somebody can benefit as an economy from having a little bit more inflation. You also see that the blame is very personalized. I wish you know, Stephanie had Putin as one of the options on her uh, <laughs> survey questions. I'm sure many people would pick that. Uh, but you know, it's very kind of embodied in specific names, like you know, is it Biden or somebody else? Um, it, which is striking because typically it's not like you know, one person who is responsible for all that stuff. Another thing which is very clear from Stephanie's work is that political polarization is very, very important in how people think about the sources of inflation and what inflation means for them. And this was probably the biggest difference between the time when Schiller did his survey and, and the current times, when you know, maybe the, we had less polarization there. But now it's very clear. If you're a Republican, you blame Democrats. If the Democrats are in power, if Republicans are in power, then Democrats are going to blame Republicans. So very different, very different from our views, right? And, um, you know, some may say, well, you know, this households, you know, how much do they know? Should we really care about this views? Maybe we should be thinking about firm managers. Ultimately, these guys are setting prices, you know, making hiring decisions. You know, they are much more important. And they also have a lot more, uh, you know, financial literacy. They are comfortable, you know, working with numbers. They have more economic knowledge. And, you know, these guys are going to have better views. And, um, you know, you look at, you know, what people are, you know, business captains, so to say, you know, say out there about inflation, and you wonder how much they really know about the state of the economy. But obviously, it's hard to generalize from one specific quote. Uh, I mean, there, there are more there. I don't want to put it here. But, you know, even if you do something a little bit more systematic, you see that the distance between managers and households is not that, you know, big. For example, 10 years ago, uh, David Romer asked uh, me, Hassan Afruzi, and a few co-authors to write a paper on inflation expectations in New Zealand, and we wanted to see how managers are thinking about inflation and what are the sources of information when they think about inflation, how they form inflation expectations. And we found that the most important sources for managers in New Zealand, low and stable inflation for 20 plus years, is gas prices. That's number one. Number two, personal shopping experience. That's the opposite of what they should be doing. They should be looking at, you know, professional forecasts. They should be looking at government agencies. You know, strikingly, very few people saw the government agencies uh, giving them anything useful in terms of information. Now, you see something similar in Stephanie's work, that, you know, people think gas prices is the best source of information or shopping experience is the best source of information when they form inflation expectations or think about inflation. And so then, you know, when you compare these results, you, you probably should think that the average manager is going to have expectations similar uh, uh, to expectations of an average consumer, an average household. So what Stephanie finds probably extends to managers as well to a large degree. Now, why should we care about this? You know, it's very easy to discount these guys and say, what do they know, you know, how much influence they have. But you know, ultimately, these people make also consumption decisions, borrowing decisions, investment decisions, right? And so maybe you know, we should be a little bit more careful about you know, these discrepancies between our thinking and their thinking. And I give you three reasons, but there are many more. For example, reason number one. When we think about priorities for the central bank, we have this wonderful result in Ukinesian macroeconomics saying that the objective function should be the variance of output gap plus variance of inflation multiplied by some weight omega. Uh, 
And typically in our models, we find that this omega is a very large number, you know, something like 200 or 300. And we often struggle with justifying why this number is so big because it tells us that, you know, the number one priority for central bankers should be, you know, inflation, stabilization of inflation. Now, here we don't have a puzzle, really, uh, from the perspective of households because they really want to have low and stable inflation. In fact, if you ask people what inflation target they want to have, they would say zero. And this is what is consistent with Carolus' presentation, that people hate inflation, but they also hate deflation. And so the majority of people want to have zero as the inflation target. They don't want to raise inflation target from two to four or from four to six. They want to lower it. They want to go to zero. And so it is important to think about this in terms of priorities. Here's another uh, reason why we should care about this. You know, 10 years ago, the main problem for us was that we had a depressed economy, inflation was very low. We wanted to stimulate the economy by raising inflation expectations. Okay? This is what our models are telling us. You raise inflation, inflation expectations, the real cost of borrowing is going down, that should stimulate consumption, that should stimulate investment. Now, Stephanie's work is saying, well, it's unlikely to happen because when you raise inflation or inflation expectations, people may think this is a bad state of the world and they can reduce consumption rather than increase consumption. So this kind of policies can uh, potentially uh, backfire. Another example, <clears throat> you know, we have sometimes, you know, sophisticated policies that rely on economic agents to understand you know, uh, complex decisions, you know, a certain degree of sophistication, right? We have to eliminate dominated strategies in, you know, in a series of rounds, right? So for example, you think about price level targeting, people should understand that above average inflation today has to be compensated by below average uh, tomorrow, uh, price tomorrow. And so this means that you have to act in a certain way when you set your prices. Now, you look at the data, and it's very clear people do not understand general equilibrium. They have generally low levels of thinking. And, and so if, if this is the landscape out there, then policies which are working phenomenally well in our models may be not you know, terribly uh, effective in practice. Now, to conclude, uh, you know, uh, Schiller's work was, at least for me, very, very influential, but I could never find his data anywhere. <laughs> so I could not really run regressions to take a look at what was happening there. I hope Stephanie is going to make her data publicly available. It's, it's a rich source of information, 30 minutes of survey time. You learn so much about these people. It's, it's, it's a wonderful source of information. Um, I also think this is not going to end this literature. This is more like um, the, the end of the beginning of this literature, right? We want to go back there and uh, look more carefully at what is happening there, what, why people hate inflation so much. Is this about uncertainty about inflation or the level of inflation? It would be also nice to have some quantitative responses, maybe through hypothetical questions. And also Stephanie cuts out work for macro theorists um, because we want to have uh, you know, a model where we could say, well, you know, we have the sophisticated agents, you know, the central bank, but we also have people who are not you know, fully grasping what is happening in their economy. And then we can talk about what should be the optimal macroeconomic stabilization policy in this context. The terrific paper, I invite everybody to read. Thank you. All right, so let's open it up for questions and comments. Uh, I'll start with Catherine. Um, thank you. It was a, a super interesting paper. I wanted to pick up on one thing I found interesting, which was the set of findings related to the response of low-income versus high-income consumers to inflation in, in the responses. It, it could well be that even if they face the same increase in prices, that high- and low-income people ha have different responses, that the low-income people are more responsive. But I also would comment that I think there's some pretty compelling evidence that prices for low-income people actually have been going up more than prices for high-income people. I'm thinking of the work by Yerevel and, and others on, you know, when you look at, very, at, a, at a very detailed level of at within a given CPI category at what high-income and low-income people buy that the prices for the items that the low-income people buy have been going up more. And that, 
could be partly explaining what we're seeing on that. Steve? Thanks. Um, yeah, really interesting paper. So I, I want to make a couple comments in partial defense of the perceptions of uh, Jane and John Q. Public. Um, so if you, you look at the Atlanta Fed wage growth tracker, which I think is particularly useful in this context because it's following individuals over 12-month intervals and then reporting the median nominal wage growth, okay? Um, and you deflate that by the CPIU. Um, you find that the median value of real wages fell 3.3 percent from 2020 quarter three to 2022 quarter four, and if you, which is a whopping big real wage decline at the median. And if you carry that forward to 2023. Q3, which was shortly before this survey was fielded, as I understand it, so that's the history people have just lived through, their real wages are still down by 1.2% at the meeting of the distribution. And so if I pick up on Catherine's point, that means, you know, if, if there is this uh, non-neutral increase in prices over this period, then I've, in effect, understated the extent of real wage declines for much of the distribution. So I put that on the table uh, um, because that's the experience people had just lived through when this survey was fielded. Um, and so it's not surprising, at least in, this, in the context of this survey, that they take a rather dim view of inflation and they see it as uh, eroding their, their, their purchasing power and so on. Um, and so, so just in terms of just their associations in their mind, but also even in terms of economic theory. I mean, we have a long history of theories of sticky wages in which wages adjust slowly. Um, the whole idea of, of inflation greases the wheels of the labor market is predicated upon the view that it helps managers cut the real wages of certain workers. Okay, and that's why we think it's good, but of course, if you're the person experiencing that, that's, uh, that's, not, that's not so pleasant. So I just want to say that people's perceptions are not quite as crazy as some of the, to the tone of some of the discussion suggests. And one, one more comment on this. You know, it, per the perceptions that people have about the costs and the effects of inflation are, are likely to be quite colored by the experience that they've recently lived through. And for everybody in this sample, the only meaningful burst in inflation in recent memory is the one that we just went through. Okay, most people are too uh, going to be too young to remember what happened in the 70s and 80s, and not all of us. But um, so, so I think there's a lesson for the Fed there as well, and for monetary policymakers, because of the experience we've just lived through, it's likely that people are going to be more averse. The average person is going to be more averse to inflation for many years to come than they were before the pandemic, pandemic happened, which was, I can't remember, was it Carolla who, who referenced, uh, who referenced the, uh, the report about uh, the Fed's previous listening round. Thanks. Christy. Uh, thank you. It was a really. Yes, it is. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so really interesting paper. I have to say my, my first reaction, I think the, the finding I found the most surprising is when you said when people, conf you know, given a simple example, could calculate inflation, because from 30 years of teaching undergraduates at Berkeley, even after a brilliant lecture on the topic, <laughs> they could not calculate a rate of inflation. So I don't know if that means you have an unrepresentative sample um, or uh, something has... has <laughs> The other piece I want to pick up on is I think one of the comments Carola made I think was just incredibly important because when you say, um, you know, I think one of your findings that you're emphasizing is, oh, people don't see the trade-off with unemployment. But of course, by the time they're having inflation, right, any of the good stuff was in the past. And I think when they say it's fiscal policy, it's monetary policy, it's Biden, they're not wrong in the sense that it was policy in the past. They might not 
you know, have said in those policies reduced unemployment, but they have the sense that um, what the government did was an important part of this. And so I, maybe I'm in, in um, the same campus saying maybe people aren't as, as um, behind as we think they are, that they're understanding there is that link. Andy? So thanks. Um, I wanted to follow up on something Carola said. I like to teach with a 1933 Pete Smith newsreel that he did for MGM explaining the benefits of inflation. Uh, he's explaining for 10 minutes why Roosevelt's policy of going off the gold standard, which he, he explains, will bring about inflation, will bring tremendous benefits. It's highly entertaining. You can get it on YouTube. But it raises in my mind two questions. One is, if do we have any historical evidence that that the public reaction to the inflation, you know, after going off the gold standard was favorable or unfavorable? And should we be hiring storytellers to effectively tell the stories of the benefits of inflationary policy? Because as economists, maybe we're not so good at it. Greg, thank you. Let me just make a comment about the um, different perspectives of um, economists and mere muggles um, on, on, um, on inflation. I think when, a, when, a, when the textbooks talk about the cost of inflation, I think they're, they're talking about the pure monetary inflation of the Milton Friedman sort, where it's all driven by money growth and everything, all nominal things are moving in parallel. And then we, we think we, that seems like just a yardstick to us. And then, then we come up with sort of pathetic things like two other costs. I think I agree with Steve, Steve Davis when she said that people are thinking about their own recent experience when they see inflation. And so the recent, the recent experience could be adverse supply shocks. So you ask an economist, how do you think about adverse supply shocks? They're going to tell you, I don't, I don't like those. They were lower real wages. They make me poorer. So I, I think people are really asking – they're not – answering the question about a, Mon a Milton Friedman style inflation, they're asking a question about the adverse supply shock inflation they've recently experienced. Elaine? Thank you. I think it was Yuri who said the average respondent doesn't understand that real wages are going to catch up. But I think that what consumers are saying is it's too painful along the way. They have really high discount rates. Right? We see that again and again. So saying, oh, don't worry, you'll catch up next year, there's too much pain along the way. And building on Catherine's point about lower income households having a different inflation experience, higher income households are going to be much more likely to own their own home. And in this past episode, there's been a really low amount of moving. So rather than experiencing the rent inflation that lower income households are experiencing, not only are they not feeling it, they're feeling a positive wealth effect, so they're having a really different experience. And then pointing back at the Schiller survey that I think it was Carola who uh, showed us that in the past, um, the statement was I'll take high inflation and low inflation and high unemployment over high inflation and low unemployment. Well, the people saying that probably think that they're not going to be the ones who are unemployed. And I think one of the real lessons to me of this recent experience is that the unemployed effect, unemployment affects the unemployed in their household. We've got recent research that says it affects also their community that's high unemployment, but doesn't affect the other people. And inflation, everyone feels. OK, I'm going to go to Zoom. Bruce Fallick, you can unmute yourself. Hi. Yeah, I'd like to raise the question of cognitive load. So the uh, a lot. We hear often that people dislike inflation. I should say sometimes that people dislike inflation because they have to think about it if inflation is too high. They don't want to think about it. They want to be able to judge prices when they walk into the store and so forth. Uh, so I may have missed uh, something uh, in, in the presentation about that, but I'd like to hear whether that idea showed up in the survey. Tara? Great. Uh, so thank you so much for the, this really interesting paper. And, um, you know, obviously uh, at Treasury we get asked this question uh, a, a lot. Um, and so actually having put out a, a blog post uh, that was entitled The Purchasing Power of the American Households uh, with Eric Van Nostrand and, and Laura Fiveson, um, 
<clears throat> we've definitely heard a lot of people pushing back on the, the, the view that there's been gains in purchasing power. So, um, you know, we haven't really been able to have an opportunity to have a two-way dialogue about this. And I really think these surveys are a way to get some of that, that insight. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way um, to kind of get that similar sense of, of, of the counterfactual, because I think that this idea that um, the ceteris paribus might be part of it here, that we're thinking it's just, you know, I could have a world where inflation's lower and my wages stay the same. Is is what people are envisioning, um, but you know, the, you know, this leads me to really think about, you know, how are they thinking about the wage process as well, and when are they thinking about getting a cost of living raise that only comes if there's an increase in the cost of living, versus when is it about their performance, and are there misunderstandings about how much of their own wage gains are coming from from performance, and is that um, part of of this explanation here as well? Thanks, Bob Hall. So there's, there's a huge amount of interesting research currently uh, on the dynamics of the individual household. And it seems like there's an opportunity to match uh, and to see if the, the, this type of information bears at all on understanding some of the, uh, some of the, dis the discoveries and, and new findings of, of, uh, of household level measurement of things like consumption. Laura? Um, great paper, as always. And so let me add um, additional evidence in favor that your results are, are OK that comes from Latin America. As you know, Latin American countries were the first ones to raise interest rates to fight inflation. And in particular, Brazil was the first one to raise interest rates to fight inflation because they know what you reported, and they know it from many years, and they know it from many episodes. They do know the poor people are disproportionately the ones that pay inflation, and they know they don't like it, and they know they blame the government. And all of that, also, they have been documenting for many years, many surveys, a lot of uh, papers. The surveys, perhaps, not as done as well as you do them, but. Uh, saying the same thing, and, and I think this is also in the Bank of Chile and a lot of the central banks. And so I, I think we should listen to the people, because perhaps what we're getting wrong is a trade-off. They know for them there is no trade-off. They're just being able to afford less. Peter. Thank you. Great paper. So I just want to go point, just connecting uh, Andy's point about storytelling with Steve's comment about the kind of average person and, and something that Yuri said. So. U.S. public, maybe a third, roughly, of the U.S. adult population has gone to college, much less read Greg Bankey's great textbook. So we shouldn't be surprised that people aren't aware of these connections, right? And if you think about, you know, managers talking about the importance of low and stable inflation and the importance of the single word communication, and we're going to hear later today about a small open economy that was actually the, the focus of the, the paper this afternoon is not about inflation. But in the context of the small open economy called Jamaica, they were able to reduce their inflation rate with a sustained high interest rate policy over the course of over 10 years because they did actually exactly what Andy was describing, of actually uh, implementing a communication policy of actually going, literally going to street corners and communicating in language that, to Steve's one that people could understand, marketplace, vegetable sellers, and everyone else, the importance of low and stable and predictable inflation to being at the heartbeat of the economy as it was uh, pr uh, projected in, in the form of reggae music. So communication is important, and we shouldn't assume that the average popul pop populace is not able to understand if we communicate with them. But I've never seen a central banker in the United States or any of the advanced economies actually on a, you know, trying to communicate with the general public in this kind of very colloquial way. John Haltoy. So I wanted to build a little bit on, on a on Catherine's comments, but talk about it from a measurement perspective. So I spent the morning with the great price division staff at BLS talking about how difficult it is to measure inflation. We're often you know, very much worried about things like substitution bias, product turnover, quality change. All those things are, are different across different product groups at different time periods and all the like. So it's not even clear we've got great average rates of inflation. And then building on Catherine's point, 
we, we're pretty convinced that there's variable rates of inflation across lots of folks, but it's not as though we have anything close to real-time measurement of that. Yarvel's works great, but the CX is pretty old, it turns out, by, by today. So anyway, I, I think that one of the reasons that you might get so much heterogeneity in responses is, is we're all struggling to both measure inflation and, and particularly for ourselves. Jonathan? Thanks. Um, yeah, no, I was actually thinking of John and uh, Emmy's work a little bit. You know, you get these periods of inflation. Some are characterized by, you know, lots of small increases in prices, and some are characterized by periodic large increases in prices. And I sort of wondered if that might help explain some of the experiences that Schiller encountered relative to relative to your survey. And then I was also curious, did anybody volunteer that inflation improves the scope for monetary policy to respond to downturns? <laughs> I, th I think I had a question in the back that I was, yes, yeah. Uh, Danny Kahneman just died. And one of his findings was uh, the emphasis on loss aversion if the variance of price changes goes up with the rate of inflation, one would expect people to be uh, less happy than they were beforehand. It seems to me this is one plausible explanation for unhappiness, particularly given the fact that wage increases lag so that one was, is hit with a wash of losses early on, which register strongly and may, though, which may be offset as wages catch up later, but only partially. Bob Gordon. Uh, I have uh, four. Uh, is, is it on? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the first goes back to FDR and why people were so enthusiastic about raising inflation. Remember that from 1929 to 1942, the correlation between the price level and real GDP or the ratio of real GDP to potential was about 100 uh, percent. Prices went down by uh, 25 percent from 1929 to 33. Real GDP went down by about 33 percent. They went up together till 1938, went down, went up together uh, up till wartime price controls came into effect. Uh, so it's not surprising at all that in that very different world, uh, people would have a different attitude toward inflation than they do now when no, no such correlation uh, exists. Uh, second point is that um, the two main inflation episodes that we can point to, the one of the last three years plus the one in the 1970s and 80s, both were generated primarily by supply shocks. Um, and, of course, people dislike supply shocks because, uh, even in theory, uh, they take away from real income. Uh, real uh, dyed-in-the-wool uh, dyed Keynesians, however, uh, might be shocked to look back at the rate of growth of the money supply. I've, I've heard uh, uh, Alan Blinder, among other people, say that, uh, oh, of course the 1970s were pure supply shocks and were not demand inflation. But if you look at the uh, growth of the money supply in the 1974-5 episode in 1979-80, to 80, uh, there were real accelerations of money growth uh, along with the supply shocks, which were partially accommodated, and that's why they had uh, such a big effect. And we all know what's happened to fiscal deficits and money supply growth in the last uh, four years. Um, the third comment is the old saying that um, individuals regard inflation as taking something away, but they regard wage increases as a reward for their own effort. And I haven't heard that distinction made uh, yet about real wages. They don't just look at real wages. They look at wages as something uh, they earned, and uh, inflation is something that society has taken away from them, possibly uh, big business. And the last comment is uh, to take up Steve Davis's interesting uh, statistic that from mid-2020 to mid-2023, uh, real wages, uh, median real wages by his measure went down by 1.3 percent. But that's not all they went down. Uh, because people expect to get a positive average annual growth of real wages uh, to go with productivity growth. Productivity growth over Steve's period was about 1.4% for the total economy. And so people uh, 
perceiving the difference between their outcome and what they should expect in the long run, something like productivity growth, were out not 1.3 percent, but more like something close to 3 percent. Uh, so the situation is more serious than um, those figures might suggest. And uh, no wonder we have uh, a low popularity rate uh, index of our current president. Maury? Yeah, I wonder to what extent um, people's uh, uh, sort of nominal liability positions might affect their attitudes toward inflation. Uh, if you have, particularly in this age of very high leverage, if you have a high nominal debt, you might think inflation is a good thing. You know, one example we have of uh, a huge demand for inflation was during the silver agitation in the U.S. in the 19th century, uh, uh, up until the gold discoveries of the 1890s, when uh, uh, f farmers uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, viewed inflation as a way to raise agricultural prices while reducing their, uh, their uh, real debts. Barry? For Andy, the, uh, the first Gallup poll was conducted in September of 1935, two and a half years after uh, Roosevelt took the U.S. off gold. Um, they asked exactly the same question, open-ended question they asked today, what do you think the biggest problem facing the country is? And inflation did not appear in the top 20. Um, unemployment was one, the budget was two, and taxes was three, keeping the country out of war was four. So either people, you know, had been traumatized, obviously, by four years uh, of very high unemployment and an inflation rate that was only like three or four percent, or Roosevelt's propaganda did work. <laughs> Wendy? So I want to posit that people can't tell the difference between a, an economy with aggregate inflation of three percent versus two percent. Um, and that what we're really talking about is how people respond to inflation of 7%. And so I totally get the political issues that we're grappling with or that are, I think, the undertones of what we're talking about and the credibility of the Fed and wildly interesting to really get into why people hate inflation. But I'm trying to figure out why we all seem to be implicitly agreeing that the world would be better if everybody understood that the simple correlations that they operate with, like how inflation matters in the world or the partial equilibrium that they think about when they think about why inflation is bad. Like, why is it, why is the world better if we can educate them that those views are wrong and get them a no more nuanced view? And so, I mean, appreciating that a more educated populace is like a good thing. Um, I'm not sure why this is a priority. If, if people had our optimal nuanced view of inflation, would that have meant that we would have proposed different policies? Um, or, I mean, would that, like, imagine two worlds going forward. Imagine a world where they, people have the views that they have, or they have this perfectly nuanced view that we want them to have. Do those two worlds mean that, you know, we have better policy in one world versus the other, that we're modeling as economists, or these political issues? I mean, and I remember when we were talking about the, when we were debating the very large fiscal support, there were some folks out there saying, this is going to cause inflation, and people hate inflation. And indeed, I think they had these sorts of political issues in mind right now. Um, but... Putting the pol I, I just want to try to figure out how much of this is about politics and political economy and how much of this is, oh, we would actually write down different outcomes in our economic modeling if people had more nuanced views. Stan? Thanks. A quick comment and a question. The, the comment, out to pick up on what John was saying, surely at some point if there's enough heterogeneity in people's inflation, um, uh, in the inflation in people's individual baskets, there comes a point where they do indeed get more information out of a trip to the grocery store or a conversation with a friend or family than from 
the federal statistical uh, uh, agencies. And so I think we should give them some credit for, for realizing that. Then secondly, it sounds like the consensus here in the room is that people are too debt set on getting zero inflation. And so does that mean that the consensus in the room is also that the reason why we have independent central banks is to prop up inflation, that it will be suboptimally low if we let elected officials set inflation? <laughs> Okay, so last question. I'm going to go to Zoom again. Alan Blinder. Thank you. Am I being heard? Yes. Yes. See somebody nodding. Uh, two, just two quick points. One is uh, a question, and one just a statement. I'll start with the statement. Uh, I was surprised Yuri brought this up. I was surprised he didn't go a little further into the so-called stagflationary view which is that bad things come in the public's mind. Bad things come together. And inflation's a bad thing, and recession's a bad thing, and it's all a bad thing. Um, this, uh, I realize this very much partly from Yuri and the work of Yuri and others, uh, along with a few co-authors. I have a paper sitting in the queue at the JEL. And one of the things, and it's about communicating with the broad public, central banks communicating with the broad public. And one of the things we found from other people's work is uh, the broad public mostly has the sign wrong on interest rates. They think interest rates going higher is inflationary. And I, the interpretation of that, I think, I think Yuri thinks this too, but he's there, is that uh, it's bad to have high interest rates, it's bad to have inflation, it's bad to have recession, that they're all in the bad bucket uh, together and it, that they're just confused. Uh, about that. I meant, by the way, to start by com by complimenting Stephanie for bringing Schiller's paper back from the grave. I thought nobody paid any attention to that uh, anymore, and I think we should and we will, thanks to Stephanie. The quick question for Stephanie is, in the recent episode, one of the things that seems to have got people very confused is the failure to differentiate between the price level and the rate of change of the price level. That's why I was shocked to hear you say that people could compute the inflation rate. Uh, there's been huge uh, complaining about recent inflation that when, if you parse the words, it's really that eggs cost more than they did four years ago, and gasoline costs more than they four, four years ago. And people are paying very little attention to the fact that CPI inflation, which was once 9%, is now 3% or less. And is was there are there answers in that paper of yours to to something like that? Thank you. Okay, let me uh, let Stephanie have the last word here. Um, you're going to have to pick and choose. Absolutely. How fast can I talk in one minute? No. So thank you all so much. I actually love these comments because typically, you know, it's my whole research agenda at the moment to understand how people think and to kind of listen to people. And I typically get beaten up in terms of why do we care? You know, what do people know? So I love these comments because my approach is we have so much to learn, actually. You know, it's a, a very reasonable constraints people are facing that we're not aware of necessarily. And there's so much learning that comes this way rather than only us saying, oh, these are misperceptions, etc. Although there are some misperceptions for sure. So really, really happy with these comments. Let me try to answer a few here. So the first thing is about this trade-off that people perceive. So uh, it's perhaps a disappointing answer, but I'm very much working on a much more complete paper where dr I'm drilling down into how people perceive these trade-offs and effects. So let's say conditional on a supply side shock, conditional on a demand side shock. What do people think through? A bit like almost a problem set, you know, that you might give. How do people imagine those effects? And so stay tuned for those effects. But one thing that you know, people mentioned is, I think inflation is a little bit like trade in the sense that, you know, there's very diffuse gains from trade and very concentrated losses. And inflation and unemployment play those two roles where unemployment is a very concentrated, acute loss to people experiencing it, but everybody feels the cost from inflation. And so I think that is when there's high inflation, that becomes very salient. When there's high unemployment, um, the other things become more salient because the costs of unemployment start to get diffuse. So it would be great to roll this over over time to see, you know, how does the saliency change? And in this new paper, I'm doing this experiment, truly conjoint experiment, to see what's the weight put on inflation and unemployment. And this clearly changes over time with the context, too. Um, 
you know, the Schiller survey had some really interesting questions that I kept as, as they were just for comparability, but the wording is not ideal, as Carola mentioned, and so many of them I have also another question that I think is phrased in a much more neutral way. I really like the comment about treatment, you know, narratives, providing information, you know, lots of people made that comment. Um, uh, and I think Peter, Andre, Andy, and that's something that I really like to do typically to test the sort of impact of pedagogical, uh, simple explanations, what this will do. In this case, you know, my feeling is it's not going to do much. And I think the point was raised that it's just truly these trade-offs might be there, but in terms of self-interest, it's just so strong to care about you know, inflation when inflation's high, unemployment when unemployment's high because the losses are so acute. Um, and then to Maury's point, I think, yes, there's, I couldn't cover it here, but uh, the data, hopefully it will be useful. Uh, it's definitely put online after this conference and, and freely available, has a lot of info on financial assets and debts of the household. And one thing we see, and that's echoing other work, people don't associate higher inflation with easier debt repayments. In fact, um, they seem... I guess to think the income effect is going to dominate in a sense, and they're going to be so much poor, it's going to be harder to repay debt, even though the value might shrink. And many people don't realize that the value of debt itself might be uh, eroded by this. Um, and so I think, you know, lots of other great comments. Hopefully we can, we can talk during the break, but thank you so much. Okay, so let's reconvene at 2.30. That was great, yeah, awesome. great session, yeah.
Okay, so let's um, get going with the second paper of the afternoon. Uh, this is a paper titled The Impact of Vaccines and Behavior on U.S. Cumulative Deaths from COVID-19, and Andy Atkinson is going to present. So th thank you very much. Um, my co-author, Stephen Kistler, is a, a mathematical epidemiologist. I've learned a lot from working with him. Uh, we have two objectives in this paper. One is just to provide a hopefully a relatively simple accounting of, as the title says, what was the impact of behavior in vaccines on uh, cum U.S. cumulative mortality from COVID-19. But the other is to um, see if we can draw lessons, if any, from this pandemic for the next one. Um, so on the first point about this estimate, we arrive at an estimate that the combination of public and private mitigating behavior within the delivery of effective vaccines in 2021 saved uh, 800,000 American lives. And the mechanism, you know, we want to emphasize the mechanism rather than have the model be kind of a black box, is basically um, a large portion of Americans, about 68%, managed to get vaccinated before they got their first COVID infection. And that that was beneficial because vaccination reduced the infection fatality rate from that infection. Uh, considerably. And so the alternative would be you got infected without the protection of a vaccine and, and you would have uh, had a higher infection fatality rate. So let me explain the data that we use to arrive at these conclusions and, and then, you know, show you how we do it. So the, the, the basic data is uh, serology data that uh, basically um, you can administer tests for two different antigens in a blood sample. Uh, you, you look for an antigen, one of which is provoked either by vaccination or infection, or a second antigen that is provoked only by infection. And so by doing two tests on a blood sample, you can see if both of them come up positive, you know somebody has been infected. If, if only the first one comes up positive and the second one is negative, then you know that somebody has been vaccinated but not yet infected. And if neither come up positive, then you know, they've had neither vaccination or infection. And so the, the red crosses in the figure are measures of um, the fraction of the population uh, from a blood donor survey that is showing the signs that they've been infected from uh, July of 2020 through the end of 2022. And the blue dots are adding to that total the portion of the population that is showing evidence that they've been vaccinated but not yet infected. Uh, now, you might naturally worry that this sample of blood donors is not representative. Actually, that's one of our points, is that somehow we were unable to, to conduct a representative survey, and that's something we should be prepared to do in the next time. But there's a second, uh, uh, there's a second sample that the CDC tracked, which was from commercial laboratories when you go in and get routine medical care and they draw blood uh, from you. They were testing uh, uh, only for infection. And those are the yellow dots. And so we take some comfort for the fact that the, the two surveys are giving similar uh, estimates of the portion of the population infected. But basically, the, 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 the way we get this estimate that 68% of the American population managed to get uh, uh, vaccinated before they got infected, by July 2021, you just take the difference between the blue dot and the red cross, and that, that's where we get the 68%. So the main things we want you to kind of take away from this graph are that um, one of them is that our mitigation efforts were remarkably successful in slowing transmission, so that by the end of 2020, only about 12% of the American population had been infected. And you should be thinking about a baseline where you know, early models of unmitigated transmission had two-thirds of the population or more getting infected. And in a place like Manaus, Brazil, where they largely did have unmitigated transmission, by the summer of 2020, you had 75% of the population had been infected. So you know, relative to these uh, unmitigated transmission, we were quite slow and you know, even kept through July of 2021. Of course, you see in the second half of 2021 and 2022, um, the, the 
virus developed ability to evade immunity. And so by the end of 2022, we're up to you know, 75% of the population has been infected. And if we had serology data going beyond into 2023 and now, I would imagine it would show that probably over 90% of us would show antigens to uh, COVID-19. So the, you know, so it's, it's clear the mechanism by which vaccines worked was not that it prevented infection. It's just that it made it less risk, less dangerous for you to get infected when, when you finally didn't get infected, which was inevitable. Okay, so then where's this evidence that vaccines protected you? Um, for 30 states in the United States, they linked vaccine data and mortality data so that when people died from whatever cause, they were able to tell if they were vac- had been vaccinated or not for COVID. So this is a graph of... Uh, weekly mortality rates for those 30 states. The orange line for those who've been unvaccinated and the the blue line for those that have been vaccinated. And so you can see that in 2021, the the, the rates are quite different and then they kind of converge after the first quarter of 2022. Uh, So the main thing I want you to see there is that in 2021, it was quite dangerous to get COVID if you hadn't been vaccinated and much less so if you had been. This is the ratio of those two mortality rates. Uh, So it's probably hard for you to read the scale. That's 0.2. So the infected had something like a fifth or less than a quarter of the infection fatality rate of the unvaccinated. And then the the difference begins to disappear, as I say, after the first quarter of 2022. But our, our thinking about that is that by that time, everybody had either been vaccinated or infected or both. And so there's no real advantage anymore to, the, to you know, have being vaccinated relative to you have protection from natural immunity if you've been unvaccinated. And so we can just do a back of the envelope calculation and say, if you take 68% of the American population and figure we're all gonna get infected, so you subject them to this four times higher infection fatality rate, you just get uh, 845,000 additional COVID deaths. Uh, that, that's kind of, you know, just multiplying two numbers together. We do a model, a full structural model of the, uh, of the epidemic to give you a more nuanced calculation. I hope the discussants will have time to describe the model, so I'm just going to show you the fit of the model. So the, the, it's, it's a model in which we have a reduced form modeling of how behavior responds to the, to the current death rate in terms of then reducing transmission and slowing COVID down. Uh, this is a, a, the blue line is a fit to the weekly death, uh, the, I'm sorry, the daily death rate over the last four years, with the red line being the data. That's the cumulative death rate. We can, in the model, count how many people have been infected. Uh, and this is the fit to the serology data. And we have a vaccination rate in the model and then a rate at which um, uh, uh, COVID is breaking through and infecting the vaccinated. So we fit the portion of the population that had been vaccinated but not yet infected, and then they start getting infected. So they, you know, that, that portion goes down. And so, that, you know, we can just, in the model, do the experiment of leave behavior the same, but just don't have any vaccines. And so what you see is in 2021, you just would have had a significantly higher death rate it would have converged kind of after Omicron came through because we'd be back in that situation that, that basically by then everybody had been infected, so it didn't make a difference anymore. And you can see the mechanism here is that the portion of the population that's infected is climbing up over 90% over the course of 2021. And as I said, that would have been people you know, experiencing that without the protection of vaccines. So, so our, this 795,000 deaths is our preferred estimate. Okay, so I want to take four lessons from this when we think about the next pandemic. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on the listing the lessons here. And this is what you know, a lot of the paper is trying to flesh out. So one is just mechanically, we needed both behavior and vaccines to work together to save lives. That uh, if you just have behavior alone, that has some advantage that we, there's some evidence that the infection fatality rate in 2020 was substantially higher than in 2021. So delaying infections had a benefit there. But the, the main kick 
you know, uh, uh, I mean, if you didn't have vaccines, you, you're largely just postponing deaths rather than, than eliminating them. Uh, on the other hand, if you didn't mitigate in 2020, we would have seen COVID just rip through the population as it did in a place like Brazil, and uh, vaccines would have been too late to really have much impact. Uh, I we would say that the success in delaying infections uh, through mitigation was a surprise. So we had experience with Spanish flu. We had quite a bit of modeling effort for pandemic influenzas. And you see in, that, in the mid-2000s, you see many of the names you would recognize from modeling COVID were experts in pandemic influenza. And, and so one conclusion from a Ferguson et al. paper is that in a pandemic influenza, if vaccines are coming after 120 days of the first worldwide case, they're largely ineffective. And so I think one of the big lessons of COVID is, relative to what we thought before, it's actually possible to slow down a highly contagious respiratory disease for quite a long time. And that opens up opportunities for public health measures that we perhaps didn't think were available in March of 2020. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what's the difference across the states? What we try to emphasize in the paper is the US states have much more in common than they had differences. You basically see in all the states the effective reproduction number falls to one very rapidly in the first you know, couple weeks of, of the pandemic. Uh, no state had a big wave other than New York City, which we would argue got caught by surprise. Uh, and uh, all states, when you look at the serology data broken down by states, managed to delay infections quite substantially into 2021 and deliver vaccines quite quickly by July of 2021. So yes, there are cross-sectional differences, but we would argue that relative to say what epidemiologists thought was going to happen in March of 2020, it's across all the states, it was a substantial surprise. But I think that the, the main lesson we would take away is the both behavior and the purpose of mitigation, or the purpose of public health interventions, are going to be different next time. Like even the mechanism by which vaccines and behavior work that, I'll talk, that I'm talking about now is not what we thought was going to be happening in, in 2020. We thought that vaccines were going to prevent transmission and, and protect us that way. So I, you know, I think that as we prepare for the next pandemic, we have to be prepared for a wide variety of scenarios that you know, will make it quite different from COVID. And uh, I, the main lesson I take away, maybe this is where I have a difference with my co-author, maybe something more in common with Jim Stock is, uh, a great frustration of economists during 2020 was that we just didn't seem to know anything about what was going on. We didn't have an infrastructure for gathering the data we needed to understand you know, how is transmission occurring, uh, uh, what, are, you know, what are behaviors are people are taking that might affect transmission, even the, 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 the biology of the disease, who, you know, when are you at risk of transmitting it, and the rest took a long time to understand. And as we just saw with the serology data, we didn't even do you know, systematic testing to, to, to figure out like how many people have it. And a contrast I like to bring up many times is we conducted the census in the spring and summer of 2020. So we spent, I don't know, $20 billion to have several hundred thousand people visit 40% of American homes. And that's like multiple orders of magnitude larger than any information gathering effort we did to like understand the evolution of COVID. So what I would like to argue for going forward you know, if there's any policy impact that comes out of this discussion is, um, I think there's a useful interchange between public health epidemiologists on the one side and economists that to, for the economists to pressure the public health people, this is a question I like to ask epidemiologists, like Mark Lipschitz at Harvard, I like to say, if we gave you $50 billion, what would you do? And I think they're not used to thinking at that scale and the economists can make the argument that in a serious pandemic, the economic costs are so large that you know, you'd want to spend a lot of money on figuring out how to mitigate at lower cost. And so I hope that 
we economists don't know what actions to take to make that happen. We talk about things, but we don't really know the details. It has to come from the public health people. But we have to somehow provoke them to think on a bigger scale about how they may, might be able to deal with the next pandemic. So uh, I hope that that will be the result of this paper. Our first discussant is Thomas Philippon. Thank you for inviting me to discuss this uh, very interesting paper. And congratulations to uh, Andy and Stephen for um, this amazing work that they've done to gather the data and really go into uh, detailed structural models to understand the dynamics of, of the pandemic. Um, so I'm going to do a quick summary and then try to give you some intuition for how these models work. So the quick summary uh, is the combination and that's the key word here, the combination of vaccine and behavioral response that saved about 800,000 lives um, compared to uh, a no vaccine uh, counterfactual. Um, so that's about you know, 25 basis points of US population. Uh, to give you a, a benchmark, the estimates we have for the so-called Spanish flu, which was not Spanish at all, um, is we lost 675,000 from a population of 100 million, so that was like a 65 basis point loss rate. So in other words, if we didn't have <clears throat> the combination of vaccine and behavioral response, we would have ended up not that far from the ballpark of the Spanish flu. Um, and the, the, one of the key takeaways from the paper is the very strong complementarity between vaccine and behavioral. Um, behavioral without vaccine is useful to delay the death. Now, it, it lowers the total, um, first because you don't overcrowd the hospitals, so you, the, the actual death rate goes down. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the dynamic is such that uh, the sum at the end, the integral depends on the path, and so you also lower it. But it's not a massive impact. So behavioral without vaccine has a small impact, uh, significant but not huge. Um, vaccine without behavior... Uh, unless you can get the vaccine in three months, doesn't do anything because by the time, even if it's 12 months, by the time you have the vaccine, if people hadn't adjusted their behavior, they would all be uh, infected, and there you get to an order of magnitude higher, like, so it's like 3 million extra deaths. Okay? So the key is that two-thirds of the population, roughly, was vaccinated before infection, and that's the average. I'm guessing in this room it's 99%. And that's an important fact to think that for, for the future. I'll, I'll get back to that this inequality there. Um, and vaccine, roughly the order of magnitude is it's 5x. Okay? So if you have the vaccine, your risk of uh, dying is five times smaller. So it's a really big effect. All right, so quickly, I'm assuming not everybody is familiar with this type of model, so I'm just going to highlight two, two or three uh, features. So the most important equation in this model is the infection um, so that's the simplified data version. What they do is more advanced, and sorry, Andy, I can't do justice to what you actually do because I, won't, I only have 12 minutes. So this is the baby version of what they do, but so you have an infection equation, which is um, it's a bit like a labor market matching model. So you have like the stock, okay, so IT plus one, that people infected next period, and that depends on uh, people who were infected before. Uh, one minus gamma because people, uh, sometimes they just recover by themselves, okay? Uh, and then you have the new infection, which is the product, so that's what you would get from a random matching model, right? It's not directed search. Um, it's beta, which is transmission, times number of interaction, which is number of infected people, and then the likelihood they meet somebody who is not infected is S over N, where S is the remaining susceptible over the total population, right? So that's pretty straightforward. The only thing that's different in these new models, and very important, is the behavioral parameter E, right? So if you write a pure epidemiology model, you put E0 equal 1, and you normalize it. Of course, in the real world, people react by cutting on their exposure. That's E going down. Okay? Um, so that's kind of, that's the key question. The second thing is we always talk about R, like the basic reproduction number. This is the number, this is the expected number of people that will be infected by the first, by agent zero. Okay? 
So agent zero, uh, discount at rate uh, gamma, because that's the rate of the recovery, and then infects beta is zero, so that's this number. Okay? And uh, if this number is more than one, growth is exponential, at least initially. So technically, just take that equation, assume that initially S over N is close to one, so that thing is close to one, so then that's just an exponential. The growth rate is one plus beta is zero minus gamma, which is more than one if and only if R is more than one. Right? So these are the key things that get into the model. So the basic, the naive... Um, epidemiological model would say R is a constant, and then you get this exponential uh, growth. Of course, what they find, what they show, is that nobody did that. Every state in the U.S. was more or less linear, which means that E moved in such a way that the resulting dynamics was not exponential, but close to linear. Um, now, the full model, you take that equation for the infection, and then you, you just do the rest of the accounting. Right? So people who... Uh, the, the top one is people who are still susceptible. Well, that's what you had, minus the people who uh, were infected and so on and so forth. Um, and you keep track of people who recover. And then if you introduce vaccine, vaccine is a way of jumping directly from susceptible to recovered in the simplified version. They have something more advanced than that. Okay? Now, the thing I want to point out is, uh, in terms of public policy, a key important uh, concern is the last equation, which is the actual uh, fatality rate is not constant, and uh, in part is driven by congestion in, uh, in healthcare. So when you run out of respirators and ICU beds, delta goes up. Okay. And so that's a big, in practice, that's kind of, that was one of the main motivations for uh, public actions. Okay. Um, all right, so then I have a, worked on that topic, so I'm just going to highlight some of the things we learned from, which is very much in, in line with what uh, Andy was showing. Um, so the first is the trade-off between infection and microbial activity. It's pretty clear, right? So people are going to, they get sick by going to work and by going shopping. So what they do, they're going to stop going to work and stop shopping. How can you improve that trade-off? Well, you can still work without going to work, okay? So working from home was important. Um, and uh, it shows up in two dimensions. One is, of course, you avoid overloading the, the healthcare system. And the second thing is you get better over time. And so that's important in terms of dynamics. So if you think about a model where people can adapt is, as, with working from home and where the number of uh, ICU beds is limited, then the two things that change in the dynamics are, are coming from that. Um, let me skip that in the interest of time. Uh, this is just the kind of simulation you get. So they would get something similar, but with more granularity and more precision. Um, maybe just a top line if you want the top left. So this is the... Macro response, what happened to C and L, right? aggregate consumption, aggregate labor. So blue would be the naive model where people don't do anything. Well, if they don't do anything, consumption and labor don't change. They change a tiny bit because some people get sick, they can't work anymore. The people who are not sick work a bit more because of the wealth effect, but that's tiny. Red is uh, what you would do optimally if you had zero option uh, to mitigate by, say, working from home. And yellow is what you do if you can work from home. So clearly what... Working from home allows you is to cut down exposure. So on the right, that's the E term. Okay, so in the naive model, E is normalized to one. In the real world, people decrease E in practice by something like 30, 40%. If you have access to a technology such as working from home, you, you make that trade-off more attractive. Okay. And then at the end, you save some lives. So you can, you can see them here. You control this uh, in the, with no mitigation the standard mitigation and working from there. Um, okay, so in, uh, quantitatively, how, how big is that? Well, if you try to quantify the models, you find that uh, having access to working from home, that gives you about six basis points. That's about 200,000 people. Um, now, the thing that's, that I find important for the future discussion is, in this kind of model, you can highlight where are the key tensions between um, the social planner and uh, the private incentives, okay? And most of them come from the perceived value of being infected versus not infected, okay? So that would, these, these are showing you the value function. Think a bit of a search model. This is the value of unemployment, the value of the vacancy, if you want. So blue is above red. That means you're better off not being sick, okay, at the top. That's the stochastic. But on the left, you have the private agent. On the right, you have the planner. And you can see the magnitudes are very different, Okay. Normalized to zero pre-pandemic, the decrease in the value function is much bigger on the right because the planner takes into account the fact that you will infect other people. 
So that's the first point. And the second point is the gap between red and blue is massively bigger. So we're talking about 20% higher, um, 20% gap, roughly speaking, for the private agent, because they know they're going to be likely to be infected unless the vaccine comes. For the planner, the gap is a factor of five, because the planner knows that a new infected agent at the beginning would increase infection in the future. Okay. So that's the key tension. Okay. And if you bring in the healthcare externality, you can even have this extremely perverse thing on the left, which is not a typo, red is above blue. Why is that? Well, if you think the epidemic is going to run wild and the healthcare system is going to be overcrowded, you might as well get infected today. You don't need crazy parameters to get that. Okay? So when you, when you have people say, well, I might as well get it now, actually, it was not necessarily privately irrational. But of course, it's a disaster from a public policy perspective. Okay. Um, now, what about the future? So three points quickly here. The first one is, no matter what we do, it's very clear that working from home is going to be a critical tool, so we should keep it. And we should, of course, the first thing to learn is where we had big issues, which is schools and broadband internet access. So the first thing to fix is this. Okay. Um, second, what about the externalities and the misaligned incentives? So the two places where there is a big gap between what private agents would do by themselves and what the government would like them to do is uh, the healthcare system congestion that we discussed. So the key there is the capacity of you know, uh, beds and uh, ventilators. And the second one is testing, actually. Testing should be mandatory because the price and incentive for testing are way too weak. On the other hand, vaccines, it's, it's not exactly aligned, but the gap is very small. Private incentives to be vaccinated are very close to the public incentives. Um, and the thing that, that helps a lot is the announcement effect. Because the key is to make people more patient, right? So they don't think, oh, I'm going to get it anyway, so I might as well get it tomorrow. You want to get that off their head. The best way is to announce a vaccine or at least a time frame, or even a, actually even an interval. You don't have to say it's going to be in 12 months. You could say it could come anywhere between 8 and 16. That's extremely helpful because then people realize, well, I just have to be patient, and then I will avoid the infection. So that actually, but on that one, the point is communication is enough. You don't have to be, uh, um, like the priorities are pretty aligned with the public ones. Um, now, two things that are remain very important. The first one is heterogeneity. Um, so there is part of it that we understand, part of it that we don't understand. The first, the obvious one was old versus young, and then that's a factor of 10 or 20 okay, in the risk. It turns out across sectors in occupation, it's also pretty big, and it's also pretty understood, like the model fit. So this is from uh, the paper I was telling you earlier. This is across industries on the, between low, medium, and high infection risk, depending on the type of occupation and, or, or that you have. And you can see the model can fit the data in the cross-section very well. And also, the magnitudes are very large. This is 5x between people like us, probably, who are in the you know, low risk, and people who are in high risk job. There's a 5x, right? Five times more risk. So that's first order also for the next one. And then the big frustration to me, which is also kind of true in this paper, there's nothing the authors can do about that, is we, after two years, we still don't understand cross-sectional variation across regions, countries, or states. Okay? And neither for the health impact nor for the economy. Like, we can't make a connection between policies and number of dead and GDP. It just doesn't work. Many people have tried. They've come, they've come up uh, empty-ended. But the data still has a factor of five. Right? So if you look at the, that's the data from this paper, between um, states that did pretty well, states that did pretty poorly, it's five times more death. Okay, so what's the conclusion? Is it um, purely random? Um, yes, in the model, because of the nonlinearity, small disturbances at the beginning, a small cluster could explain the thing, but it's very frustrating. Okay, and um, all right, so to conclude, um, they, they make four points. The first one, I think I I, I'm fully convinced, it's a great point, it's the complementarity part. You need both. Second point, Long-term mitigation was a surprise. The fact that we could wait so long. Yes, but no. So uh, the first thing is, compared to 1919, we had these options, working from home, the internet, that helped us maintain economic activity while decreasing exposure. 
Guys, 100 years ago, didn't have that option, so that's one. And the second thing is it cost us $5 trillion. I mean, Christina had a very nice paper in 2021, if I recall. Um, $5 trillion is, you know, what it took to make them patients. Well, actually, I think we all, I mean, at least my reading is there was $2 trillion good, $1 trillion to abuse, $2 trillion wasted. Um, so maybe $3 trillion, that's still a lot of money. Okay, so they, the fact that people were patient didn't come out of nowhere. Um, Across states, to me, that's a big frustration. We still don't understand. And again, like New Hampshire, Vermont, look like Denmark. Arizona, Mississippi, look like Russia. So these are not small differences, and we have no clue what explains them. Okay? It's not, people have tried. So to me, that's the, the big frustration. Um, the fourth point, I think, is pretty obvious, so I don't want to be late. Thank you. Our second discussion is Cody Wing. Hi, everyone. Oh. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for having me here. And um, this is a really interesting paper to read and, and go through. Um, I am going to talk basically about two, two main things. So first, um, I want to talk about just the idea of these sort of compartmental epidemiological models and, uh, you know, uh, how we can maybe try to, like, I think one thing we can do is try to make those better for future epidemics, uh, and there's stuff we can learn from, from this paper uh, about maybe how we can do that. And then the second thing, it's partly an example of this, is that um, the way that vaccines are modeled um, in, in, in these sort of compartmental models, I think are... are rely fairly heavily on some assumptions about how vaccines work in the real world. Um, and maybe that's an area where uh, different styles of research could help build better models in the future. Um, so why are these useful? One reason is just that they give you a, a, a platform for thinking about how broad changes in uh, public policy might affect the course of an epidemic. They take the dynamics of the epidemic and allow you to turn certain things on and off if you believe the structure of the model. Um, what do they really look like? So the simplest model, which you've probably seen before, is this uh, susceptible, infectious, recovered model, SIR model. And it's, it's built around three compartments, three states, and people move between states. The population moves through these states uh, according to some parameters like uh, uh, a transmission rate beta, um, and a mortality rate uh, and a recovery rate. Um, so this is helpful. They're not that useful. This, this simple model is not that useful for describing the dynamics of an epidemic, though, because it, it just sort of leads to one big peak and then everything dies out very fast. Um, so if you want a model that fits the real world, you have to complexify a little bit. And that's what uh, Andy's paper does, or that's one of, the, one of the things it does. So what does a more complicated model look like? So this is something close to what, um, to what the model used in the paper looks like. So uh, what they have done in some ways is uh, add a bunch of compartments. And that uh, allows some oscillation and slows down the time between, uh, between different uh, you know, exposures and, and movements between boxes. And they've added a lot of parameters. Okay? Uh, and they've added uh, disease variants. These are things that, uh, some of which we learned over the course of the epidemic. So what happened is we started with a basic model and then saw stuff happening in the world and added a box or added a parameter to accommodate that. Um, at some point, the vaccine comes into play, and then there's a flow, uh, sort of a another way to move from susceptible to recovered uh, that doesn't cause mortality. Um, you can kind of see uh, how problems might arise here. So what happens is, you choose all of these boxes and parameters uh, so that you can uh, you know, turn the crank on the model and predict mortality in a way that fits what the observed pattern is. And once you find a collection of boxes and parameters uh, that, that does the job, now you can start turning off certain parameters and certain boxes to see counterfactuals. And the question is whether that is uh, credible or whether that was an elaborate sort of curve-fitting exercise uh, and, and the counterfactual maybe is not so credible. Um, so, um, so what are these parameters? And how could we learn more about them? 
So uh, there are baseline transmission parameters. Okay, those uh, those are pinned down a little bit, right? The paper uses uh, estimates of transmissibility from epidemiological research. So it's not a free parameter that you just choose. They, they pick it uh, and, and try and justify it. Uh, but the, the timing of when the new variants come into play, this you just have to wait until a new variant comes in and then turn it on in your model. Uh, there's probably some seasonality. Uh, so you have to choose a, a, a way to represent seasonality. You just choose something. Um, the same thing with uh, mortality rates, which may change over time, uh, perhaps due to the healthcare system or perhaps due to the variant. So these are all things that we could study separately and get better parameters and, and pin down more of them without sort of requiring us to, to fit the curve. Um, so uh, the key feature of this modeling exercise here is that, uh, or one of the key features is that um, the transmission rate in the model is supposed to be responsive. The people are, are uh, imagined to look at the death rate that is happening in the economy or happening in the, uh, uh, in the country, and they're going to change their behavior in some way. That's kappa. Okay? Uh, they're going to change their behavior in some way that reduces the transmission rate. It's not described in the model exactly uh, what that behavioral change is, but it, it could be all sorts of things. They could wear masks. They could stay home from work. They could stay home from school. Okay, they do something, and that reduces the transmission rate. Okay, at some point, uh, maybe they aren't so responsive. Okay, there's fatigue, and so then kappa goes down over time. Okay, um, so again, these are things where you could imagine people studying directly uh, what's the effect of uh, a mortality shock on behavioral adaptations. And maybe that would give us a way to not just choose kappa to match a curve, but to uh, just sort of plug in an external estimate. So uh, the collection of boxes and, and parameters used here uh, fits the observed data very well. Okay, and so that's encouraging. Um, but I think it would be helpful in this whole literature to think of more creative ways to. Uh, to make external predictions of what this model should look like. I'm not sure we should view this in-sample fit as, as powerful evidence that we've got the right collection of, of parameters and boxes. Uh, so what would work out of sample? You know, one idea is to try to think about uh, some parameters or responses which, are, um, which, which could be studied in sort of quasi-experimental settings. Then the model could make a prediction of what that that sort of treatment effect is supposed to be, and you can see how well it lines up. Uh, another idea is to think that um, you could sort of have a, a different geography, uh, a different country or a different state that isn't used uh, in sort of building the model, uh, and you could ask how well the, the collection of parameters describes the dynamics of that epidemic. Uh, but there's probably lots of other ways to do this, but I think it would, it would improve the credibility of the, the model. Okay, so one idea... Um, the closest I can come to something um, uh, that I think we, we've started to learn a little bit more about is, is this idea of vaccines and spillovers or externalities from vaccines. Um, so um, if you think about uh, a vaccine, most of us think of sort of two kinds of effects that a vaccine might have. One is the own effect or the direct effect of the vaccine, Okay. This is the idea that if you get vaccinated, you'll be less likely to get infected or, or, or die of the illness. But there's also the possibility of an indirect effect. That's where uh, if I get vaccinated, you're less likely uh, to be infected. Um, and uh, that's important because those, those things are the sort of basis for, you know, ideas that the, the vaccine may have positive externalities. So where do these indirect effects come from? Uh, it's somewhat complicated. One, I, one version of a vaccine is a vaccine with sterilizing immunity. Uh, if a vaccine has this property, uh, it, it does indeed sort of uh, stop you from getting infected, and therefore you can't transmit the disease to someone else. But many vaccines are not like that. Uh, it's possible to have a non-sterilizing immunity, which means that you're, you know, you're less likely to become sick, but it doesn't fully prevent you from being infected or from transmitting the disease. Um, in the real world, there's probably some kind of spectrum 
right? There's no such thing as perfect sterilizing immunity. Okay, so how do vaccines work in terms of these compartmental models? Well, essentially the spillover effect happens because when people get vaccinated, they just get removed from the susceptible uh, box, the susceptible compartment. Okay, so there's a linear reduction in, in the, the number of people who are able to be infected, and that's how there's a externality, that's how there's a spillover. Um, that is more or less the type of uh, vaccine that is modeled in the papers, although there is a little bit of nuance there because they, they, they allow for um, some waning and some people sort of are false vaccinated. Um, how would that change if you model a vaccine that, that had non-sterilizing immunity? Well, here you'd have to imagine that some fraction of the vaccinated will have a breakthrough infection, okay? And then possibly they will, uh, you know, be eligible to infect other people. And so if you have a, a model like this one where there is some possibility of, of reinfection, uh, then you, you don't get this protect the unvaccinated effect and the, and the vaccine just has its own direct effects on people. It doesn't have big spillover effects. Um, so there's some recent work on this. Um, so uh, one, one study has looked at um, the effect of college vaccine va mandates. Um, and, uh, and how that sort of reduced our affected uh, infection and mortality uh, in surrounding communities. These find some evidence that places that had a, a, a college, if you look at just at college towns, uh, places that counties that had uh, a vaccine mandate had lower, lower infection rates and lower mortality in their surrounding community. So that suggests there is a bit of a spillover. Um, and then some of my own work looks in Indiana at 11 and 12 year olds where there was, there was a six month gap in, in when the two groups became eligible for the vaccine. We look at uh, spillovers in two settings, so in schools and in households. And we find um, when, you, when you sort of compare uh, sixth graders, these are the kids that are not gonna be eligible. Some of them are in middle schools where they go to school with vaccine eligible older kids uh, to sixth graders who are still not eligible they are in elementary schools. When we look at that, we find no evidence that there's a spillover effect. The sixth graders that go to school uh, with the vaccine eligible older kids are not less likely to be infected with COVID. But when we look at the same experiment in households, where we look at households who have an extra vaccine eligible kid uh, versus households that don't, uh, there we do find the people living with the kid with one extra vaccine eligible kid, they're less likely to be infected with COVID. So that suggests, you know, we find fairly large direct effects of the vaccine. Uh, we don't find much spillover in the school setting. We do find a spillover in the household setting. I think the rationale for that is that it has to do with the degree of mixing. And that suggests that in these uh, structural epi models, that question of random mixing and uh, how different interventions are likely to affect uh, mortality, uh, you know, may be an important way to sort of improve the complexity of the model. Um, and I will stop there, I think. Great, so let's uh, open it up. Um, let me start with Louise. I just wanted to comment on the cross-state variation in um, in outcomes. So this paper points to behavioral, the importance of behavior, and I think that's what explains the cross-day variation very well, which is a, sort of the politicization of the virus. So if you look at the data across days for 2020 and 2021, you can explain very well the differences in unemployment rate, labor force participation, consumption by the share of people who voted for Biden. Um, and that also explains the share of people who are vaccinated. That's not, it's not lockdowns, it's not state mandates, it's people's attitudes themselves and the behaviors they took. I think that explains it. Jim Stock. Thanks. Uh, this, is, this is really a great paper. And I, I wanna, even though, yes, the model seems somewhat complicated, it actually, and, and although it's worth validating it on other countries, I think it just does a fantastic job at, at fitting these data in what actually is a fairly simple model. 
uh, given that there are some realities that have to be taken into account, like the different, infe different um, infectiousness rates of the different variants and the different fatality rates of the different variants. So I think this is a really important contribution, and I think it's uh, something that it will hopefully will really inform the uh, EPI community uh, going forward. I have just a couple of uh, specific uh, comments. Um, uh, one is that in this, um, the importance of the interaction of behavior and the vaccine. Uh, in this particular case, waiting is good for two reasons, one of which is that it gives you time to get the vaccine. So that's sort of obvious, and we get to quantify that. It's also good sort of for like a luck reason, which is that if you are self-protective during the first wave, it turns out the first wave had the highest fatality rate. So you kind of then got if you didn't, then if you got sick later, it wasn't as likely to kill you. So that's sort of a, that's a little less generalizable, perhaps. Um, the, I, I, on the state variation, yes, uh, it's definitely true that there are state variations in rates and so forth, but I just find figure 10 uh, remarkable that all of the states have this effective um, R our effective plunging towards one and then oscillating around one. So at a really macro level, whether you have uh, an R of Republicans or Democrats or state-mandated non-pharmaceutical interventions or none, in all of these you see really large um, self-protection activities. And I think the final comment is at a, at a high level, um, there's so much work that just I, I really hope we continue, even though all of us would like to just lever see another SAI, I mean, I'd never, I'd like to see another, another SAI or model and not talk about COVID again. The reality is we've got to be ready for this sort of thing in the future, and there's so much work that needs to be done on the macro, on the data collection scale. I mean, just think of just the one statistic from the paper. You were able to use the 30 states that had linked the um, mortality data and the vaccination data, 30 states? Why, why states? Why 30? I mean, that's just crazy that we're not doing something that basic at the national level, not to mention a whole list of other things. Stephanie? Great. Super interesting paper. Um, I was wondering, and I couldn't get this from the model, how are you thinking about the fact that it's not like a one-time vaccination? It's like a repeated thing that has to happen because of the mutations, updated vaccines. So I didn't know if that was in the model or it's more like a one-shot thing um, because the fact that it has to be repeated, I guess, you know, raises different different dynamics. And the other thing is on the political economy part, which Louise also mentioned, yes, I think there's super strong evidence for the political polarization on this. And another thing I wanted to mention as we think about, several people mentioned expectations, you know, what will happen to you if you get vaccinated or not, that the political economy here of trust in government, trust in scientists is super important. And it's been really deteriorating, um, lots of evidence showing that. So wondering how that will play out in like simulations about the future and predictions for a future pandemic. Uh, Maury? Yeah, there's a great paper, Andy, on a, on a super important topic. Um, and, uh, you know, it's great to be able to sort of nail down, um, you know, the role that um, delay played, you know, the lockdowns, particularly in the politicized environment that we're in. Um, but, you know, as, as I'm sure you're, you'll agree that, um, you know, next time it could be a totally different pathogen and we could be in a very different situation. I mean, before COVID-19, people were thinking about avian flu as the most likely um, cause of a pandemic and avian flu has now reached you know cattle in the midwest and penguins in antarctica whether this is an avian flu that could jump to humans we don't we don't know but that's part of the problem we you know we need to we need to kind of get on on top of these things uh you know in fact in in this latest episode in covid we were incredibly lucky to be able to get vaccines as quickly as we did uh, we had the mrna technology waiting and it was a particular type of virus that was very susceptible to um, the mRNA method. There are other viruses which are not and which um, have taken much longer uh, to, to deal with if we have indeed dealt with them uh, already. Uh, and furthermore, next time when we think about, you know, can we do what we did last time? Well, the politicization that uh, Stephanie and Louise mentioned, 
is going to be a big factor. Imagine a new virus and then uh, the government calls for lockdowns. Uh, uh, I think any future pandemic is likely to be as politicized. And uh, one particular flashpoint is the issue of school closures, which for other pathogens could be much more uh, necessary than uh, you know, what, what we had. Uh, the, the 1918 flu uh, hit younger people much more, um, much more strongly. Um, you know, Andy called for thinking big, and I would, I would submit that there, there has been some big thinking. Um, there, were, there were two high-level panels in 2021 that looked at funding uh, uh, and uh, other reforms for uh, global cooperation in pandemic surveillance and response. Uh, Bill Gates wrote an excellent book in 2022, and the problem is that, um, you know, nothing, nothing much has happened. Very little of, of those recommendations have, have been implemented, and people have become pretty complacent. You know, the deaths have gone way down. People still get the, uh, the, uh, the disease, but we also have good antivirals, which is another aspect of the response that we need to think about in a future pandemic. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we kind of need to get on, 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 the, uh, um, on the job here as an international community. Uh, and there are things we can be doing, for example, uh, surveillance of uh, animal reservoirs of potential viruses that could jump to humans and thinking about what kind of vaccines might be effective, how those viruses might behave. Uh, but this requires funding and it requires international cooperation. And both of those are in very short supply right now. Stan. Thanks. I think this paper is, is very good, too. I think some of the uh, policy recommendations are perhaps a little naive. I think Stephanie highlighted some of the, the constraints we've already run into with, with NPIs. Uh, I don't think you know, adding a testing mandate is going to go over. Uh, super well, not just in the U.S., but in, in Western European countries, too. Um, I think a similar thing is true on the public health side. Uh, I, I think, Andy, you, you said that the public health guys are not used to receiving funding at the scale of the census. The CDC budget is $10 billion a year. During the pandemic, we sent them an additional $25 billion, plus, I think, $40 billion to hand out to st state public health agencies, plus $15 billion for uh, ATSER. And so they're, they just decided we're not going to do uh, a random sample of, you know, of people in the U.S. to see if they have COVID. And so at some point you have to say, okay, well, you know, maybe that's not a super productive uh, agency to give money to or profession to try to engage with. Um, yeah. Sebnim. Um, great paper. So I would like to come back to this uh, policy recommendations and how can we do better, right? I mean, given all these issues the money, people don't want to do it and all that. So a big thing I think we learned from uh, this pandemic, and it can be different next time, as Maurice is saying, is the sectoral dimension, right? We, we learned the contact intensive sector and the sectors where you cannot work from home. Those are the problem sectors, right? This goes back to uh, Thomas' point. And in fact, if you look at internationally, all those countries, you mentioned Brazil, there is Iran, you know, India, all those countries are going to not, not, they are not doing the mitigation either because there is some reason, political or whatever you want to call it, they don't believe it, or you know they are in an informal sector, they have to go out and work, it's not just possible. So lockdowns is the second best, right? Lockdowns is the second best to your behavioral mitigation where you know people don't want to do it or they cannot do it type of reasons. Then, you know, how do we target them, right? right? Uh, you know, how can we target lockdowns so that we don't spend five trillion and we really um, kind of get the biggest buck out of that. I mean, you know, certain sectors should be targeted. I mean, if this is a similar case, it is the contact intensive sector where, you know, people provided more uh, opportunities to work from home or they are just not going to work and the money will go to them. I mean, but I think these are the ways that we should be thinking, really some sort of uh, targeting that goes with the uh, disease uh, transmission. And in fact, that's why the sector model fits very well. I mean, we wrote two papers, one of them titled The Economic Case for Global Vaccinations. I presented this paper in January 2021. We also used the SIR model with combined with the economic model because the data wasn't out there. So I fully agree with you that we have to collect more data, but I think all of these things should be done uh, targeted by taking the, the nature of the disease uh, into consideration. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I have to say it's a fantastic paper. Um, so I'm sort of curious to know how we can use a model like this to learn more about the economic cost of the different choices. I mean, I mean, a thing I think a lot about is the learning loss from the school closures. This room, if this hadn't happened, would be having every other year, you know, some conference on inequality and how terrible it was. And I think, you know, I don't think anything's happened and is going to happen that's of the scale that this might have that might require further studies. But, you know, those of us who teach, even at leading universities, see the COVID learning loss. It's just stunning. Uh, so, you know, how can we, that's just an example, because next time it might be like the 1919 where it's, uh, the fatalities are in the young people. But sort of how can we, what kind of information can we get, gather, how quickly to determine what the right mitigation efforts are? I mean, I would say perhaps a completely wrong conclusion that a lot of people have reached is Sweden had it right. And you figure out who to lock, who to lock down, and don't do it to anybody else. And uh, the Chinese are at an absolute opposite extreme, obviously, of all of this. But so, how can we use a model like this? What information do we want that's more nuanced to quickly decide what the most effective uh, mitigation efforts are to buy time for the vaccine? Steve Davis. Everybody else has already said what a great paper it is, so I won't. But um, on the issue of the distrust of public officials, public health officials and political leaders, I think it's a fact, um, but it's not one that I think we necessarily uh, should take as a given. So in addition to the, the kind of call in the paper for a, a vastly improved data, data collection infrastructure, which I wholly endorse, some thought given about how to make that information that's collected transparent and credible across all quarters of society, uh, which clearly didn't happen last time, um, would, is also uh, worthwhile and needs to be on the agenda so that it doesn't get quite so politicized if and when we next have a pandemic. Second point, um, it's a smaller point, but, but um, Andy alluded to this, that you know, there's the, the resilience value of working from home. And uh, that's one argument for widespread access to uh, internet, high quality internet. So Jose, Maria Barrero, and Nick Bloom and I have a paper that um, uses survey methods to assess the extent to which people have uh, high quality internet access and it affects their productivity and work from home mode. So what we did is we asked everybody who in our survey who had worked from home at some time during the pandemic, which was most of the workforce, um, if the quality of their uh, internet access, uh, assuming they had it, if they had it, and then if, uh, if it had affected their work qual, their, their, work, their, their ability to work productively. About three quarters of the population of people who had worked from home at some point said, no, it was perfectly adequate. But the other quarter said either they didn't have internet access or the quality of their in access was sufficiently unreliable and low quality that it did impede their productivity. And in many cases, it impeded their productivity greatly. So there is, and so the paper goes on to try to quantify the extent, you know, how much, out, how much uh, could we have mitigated the output loss during COVID if everybody had access to high quality internet? By our estimates, it's 3%. So there's economic resilience value there, and I think part of Andy's point, as I understood it, is if everybody has high quality access to internet, they'll be more willing to do things from home, including working, and help slow and, and voluntarily undertake actions that uh, slow the transmission of the virus in the early stages before a vaccine. Uh, Larry? Uh, thanks. Um, so I have a, a big picture question. I, I guess the big picture conclusion of the paper is things could have been a lot worse, 800,000 worse if nothing had been done. Could, could things have been a lot better if, if we had, you know, philosopher kings who know everything we know now pursuing exactly the optimal policies 
um, how much less, uh, you know, how many fewer deaths could there have been? Can you have any kind of number for that? Tristan? Well, Thanks. Um, I have a comment leading to a question about external validity for developing countries. So um, I have a paper with Ruchir Agarwal where we got data on basically all the purchase orders that countries had made for vaccines. And we demonstrated that most of the delay in deliveries to developing countries could be attributed just to the fact that they ordered much later. They waited, um, not uh, some delay that was independent of when they ordered. Um, and initially we thought, oh, this is irrational, right? If you look, you have to have such a low statistical value of life, you know, to, to justify not buying a vaccine. But I think in your paper, it, it shows that actually if you don't have the work from home technology, um, you, you get this kind of after 120 days, it's not worth it anymore. So today when we're asking developing countries to put some money in a place to be able to purchase vaccines on day zero, there's not a lot of appetite. And I'm wondering if your paper suggests that may be rational. Carol? Um, yeah, also should say it's a great paper, but again, it's been said. Uh, very quickly, uh, on the behavioral response, what I've, in the little bit of looking around I've done at COVID vaccination rates, the big variance is not states across states, it's across counties within states. There's huge variance. So I'm wondering if you couldn't somehow play with the standard deviation of vaccination rates in states, if that makes a difference as you, you know, think about the, the overall aggregate outcomes seeming like there's no difference between states, but it's sort of... Wait. Thanks. So in public health, there's a clash of cultures often, right, which is the pure public health people are effectively doing max H or max health, and the economists are doing marginal this equals a marginal that, and the marginals include external costs and benefits, and, you know, we, we, I obviously prefer the latter framework. Um, and part of our contribution is making that point, but also measuring that point. Um, and uh, the discussants, I think, made the correct point, which is that a lot of the, actually the benefits of the vax, don't get vax decision is is internal, which is not to say there's not external benefits, but but the subsidy may not m need to be complete. Uh, on the other hand, we had a situation where the subsidy was, you know, close to 100 percent with mandates. Um, and so then there's this other argument that, the, well, there's an interaction, right? The, the other externality is not the, in, uh, the, the next trans person who gets infected, but the fact that it changes the, the properties, the incentive to delay. Okay, but that's still a, so we'll call that, I'm happy to call that an externality in an interaction sense or a second best sense, but it still, I think, is important for us to say what that is, right, to measure that, because we want to get, we want to get the marginal this equal to marginal that. And so um, that's in the model, but it's not, it's not reported, I think, but in the model you can, you can get that, and then you can play with it, right? So, for example, what if we had a situation where we had an Omicron-like transmission rate at the beginning, <laughs> Right? Does, does this effect you're describing disappear? Because right? it would be too fast. It would be like what Ferguson said about what the flu was, just as a thought experiment. Thank you. Gerald? So I, I'm struck to, or I, I'm gonna, I wanna tie the two papers that we, we've just seen together. So the last paper, we had a big debate about whether peop, the public knowing things about inflation would be helpful to policymakers. And in this paper, we basically said, if the public had more information about the propagation mechanism or about the benefits of vaccines, we would be much more, you know, we would be, the, the benefits would be substantially greater than the public knowing about inflation. So the question as economists we should be asking is, what can we do to optimize people's information about the benefits of vaccines or the benefits of, of uh, private mitigation versus uh, versus what we should be doing as economists to think about the benefits of people knowing more about inflation propagation. Bob Hall. So I'd like to to plunge a little bit into this question of what what value is is lost. I think I think there's this five trillion dollar number. I'm not exactly sure. How, how how that's generated, but 
basically, the facts are, are right at the beginning of, of COVID, uh, whereas that 17 million workers were put on temporary layoff uh, in the very end of March, and mo primarily, almost all in April. Half of them were back at work after that, and, and, and a similar con going on tale. No con there was no decline in consumption, or not a material decline in consumption. Um, uh, there was obviously a correspondingly large loss of output. And the question is, how do we price? Uh, do we, is there any offset to the fact that, first of all, it was April, so it's not a bad time to, to have some leisure. This question of, of how you value leisure in, in, in business cycle uh, uh, is, I, it's, it's really very strong. And I'm not, I'm not I, I haven't, I haven't t tried to, to you know, really do this, but it seems like it seems like we should be very careful in in, in explaining just all the things uh, that uh, uh, all the things that happened together uh, with respect to the there was indeed a very large decline in employment and a very large decline in, in output, um, but but a corresponding increase in other activities. Raghu. Yeah, great paper. Uh, I want to take off on Tristan's point, which is that why were the deaths in, uh, why were the vaccinations in emerging markets so low? Well, I can talk about one country, India, which was uh, India undercounted the deaths hugely from the first wave and, uh, you know, had thought that it was actually, there were stories going around, Indians are immune to this stuff because they've, They've gotten uh, immunization in their childhood uh, playing in the dirt. And so uh, it was a, a very wrong characterization. It was just that we hadn't counted the deaths properly. And there was a strong desire to suppress the actual number of deaths because that was a reflection of how good your health care system is in every state. And so when the second wave hit, we hadn't vaccinated enough, and it hit hugely. The tragedy is we undercounted the deaths in the second wave also. And today, there's a sense that India did fantastically well from the COVID uh, episode. Our death rate is lower than the US. It's, it's about 500,000 in a population of 1.4 billion. Of course, when you do the, you know, how much the real deaths were and what the undercounting were, you get something much, which is much more credible, five to six million deaths in India. But uh, we'll never take a proper accounting. And that's the danger of getting bad data and making bad policy on the basis of bad data. Okay, I'm actually going to second Larry's question and then turn it over to uh, Andy again. You, you might have to third it. Uh, the, for me, just because I, I imagine I don't have much time, the, it was your comment that is the central one. So economists you know, sprang into action when COVID hit to dream up all kinds of ideas about can we do things with sectors, can we do testing, can we... You know, we had all these ideas, and then every time I find myself talking to epidemiologists, and perhaps it is my naivete, I was like, what, what do you guys want to do? And, and nothing came back. And, and, I, and so I refuse to believe that we were out of options. And, and, but it may be the case that I'm naive, and in fact, we were out of options, that there was actually nothing practical to be done. And... and, and Economists, I think, still have lots of ideas. Uh, but as you said, you know, we, we sent lots of money to the CDC, uh, or Jim Stock and I participated in conversations with some prominent epidemiologists, where it's just like, how, how can you be out of ideas? And, uh, and so I was frustrated, because normally in the background, public health is working. You, you know, all kinds of pathogens are coming to the United States. T tuberculosis cases come in all the time. I actually got, got quarantined about 20 years ago for an intestinal parasite you know, that was picked up. And so you know, it just doesn't disrupt our lives too much. And then all of a sudden, they were threw their hands in there, is the way I see it. If, if I, and so perhaps it is my naivete or all of our naivete that we can't really answer your questions because we actually don't have that many tools. But I, I, in some sense, I refuse to believe that, that if we, if we didn't, you know, the military has to plan for all kinds of contingencies and they war game stuff and they have to, if they tell you we can't defend against this, then you, they usually get a response, well, you better figure out how to do that. 
and, 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 and that's the interaction that I would hope to see, that economists might push more. And as Stephen Kistler says, that that's actually what he's working on right now with other epidemiologists. But so I want us to get involved and say, get serious about it. Next time, have an answer. You know, have something to try. Because the willingness to spend, given the economic costs, is massively high. So sorry, I'm not sure I answered your question. <laughs> But you have a few more minutes if you have anything more you want to say. Well, I don't know that we could have done that much better. I think actually we did surprisingly well, unless vaccines had come much, come much faster. I mean, I do think the, the, if you want to blame it on politics, the easiest thing to do is count deaths starting in July of 2020 and, and go from there. And it's almost perfect sorting of the 50 states by political alignment. I mean, it's literally almost uh, R, uh, whatever, R squared of one on, on it. Is that a choice? In other words, that might be a personal choice that we would have to respect, that by, by July of 2020, states were allowed to pursue their own different policies. They're democratically elected. They accepted a higher death rate. I mean, I, I, I don't know that we necessarily want to federally mandate them not to do that. Uh, uh, but uh, that, anyway, that's why we try to stay away from the kind of political things, because I think at some point you have to respect individuals who are making different choices. All right, let's uh, leave it at that and uh, reconvene at 4 p.m. <laughs>
Okay, um, let's try to get going with the third paper for the afternoon. I'm going to let everybody sit down. Okay, so the third paper this afternoon is titled Sustained Debt Reduction, the Jamaica Experiment, and Barry Eichengreen, exception, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, Barry, Barry Eichengreen is gonna present. Thank you, John. Um, I, re I really shouldn't do this because there are people in this room who've um, been here longer than I have, but I can't resist observing that this is the 50th anniversary I think to the day of the first time I attended the Brookings panel. Um, I was a... I, I was a lowly research assistant at the time, which is encouragement to the lowly research assistants in the room. Um, we were away from home and away from college where other people had prepared our, our meals for the first time. And we put together a cookbook of our, our discoveries. It was called Brookings Papers on Home Economic Activity. <laughs> Proceeds went to charity, and the publications department was more relaxed than they are now. They let us use the actual cover to BPA with one <laughs> modification. So uh, the paper, it's uh, the Jamaica exception. Uh, Jamaica is uh, more generally the point being that sharp, sustained reductions in public debt are, are exceptional, especially recently. We know this because debts have been rising globally across the board, and in particular in the middle-income emerging markets that are our focus uh, in this paper. The fund had a blog post this morning where it displayed how uh, debt-to-GDP ratios in, in emerging markets have risen since the global financial crisis from about 40% to about 80%. Um, now, governments, as you know, borrowed in response to financial crises, pandemics, wars, other uh, emergencies appropriately, in our view, but only in very rare instances have they succeeded in, in bringing those higher public debt ratios back down once that emergency passed. Why they have not succeeded more broadly is straightforward enough. Um, both economic and political factors have been unfavorable. Slowing GDP growth and rising real interest rates have made for adverse debt dynamics. Ideological polarization and frequent government turnover make it hard to stay the course. Turnover creating an opportunity for a new administration to repudiate the, uh, the policies of its predecessor, polarization making it hard to agree on how to share the burden of fiscal uh, adjustments. So you put all that together, and uh, Sirkin and I concluded in a paper we wrote for the Kansas City Fed's Jackson Hole conference last summer that one is left pessimistic about the prospects for sustained uh, public debt reduction. The best we can do is to learn to live with these heavier burdens for the foreseeable future, at which point a member of the audience, um, Peter Henry, raised his hand and said, what about my country of birth, Jamaica? Indeed, what about um, Jamaica? You can see here that Jamaica is uh, an exception. You can see what it has done uh, beginning roughly in 2013, how it's reduced its debt ratio from on the order of 150 percent of GDP to, to today on the order of 70 percent of GDP, despite uh, the interruption from the COVID pandemic and how it's on course to bring that debt ratio down to 60 percent by uh, 2028. And you can see from the blue line uh, how it has done it. It has done it by running large primary budget surpluses year after year after year after year on the order of 8% of GDP on average over the period. That record is truly exceptional. So in table one of the paper, we look at different thresholds. The threshold here is the list of all emerging markets in developing countries that have reduced their debt by 40% of GDP or, or more over five years. And the list is comprised of five episodes. 
um, Jamaica there in the middle. I'm not that familiar with uh, the Bulgarian, Jordan, Indonesian, Lebanese cases. They, they were uh, products uh, of relatively strong growth, I think, in each case after bad times. And you will see that relatively strong growth is not part of the Jamaican story. The other figure in parentheses here is, by our calculations, how much debt reduction was achieved by running primary surpluses. And you can see that Jamaica stands out even relative to the other four uh, country episodes on the list, where the vast majority of its debt reduction was achieved by running primary surpluses, not so in these other cases. So I note here that we're looking at emerging markets in developing countries. We left out advanced uh, economies, of which there are two or three that meet this threshold. We left out cases where countries were able to bring their debt ratios way down all at once by re repudiating or restructuring debt, uh, something that Jamaica didn't do in the period. We apply the standard debt decomposition simplest version, where the change in, in the debt to GDP ratio B is a function of, of uh, the primary deficit ratio D, um, the real interest rate, real growth rate differential interacted with the inherited debt and everything else which is dressed up in such calculations as the stock flow uh, adjustment. So if you look at the entire period of concern to us, of interest to us, um, 2013 to 2022, you can see that it's all about the primary surplus, the big blue part of the bar. Growth helped a little, but growth was three quarters of 1% on average. Per capita GDP growth was nil, give or take, over the period in question. There, the negligible contribution of, of the real interest rate here, of the negative real interest rate here, is a reminder that Jamaica did not inflate away the debt. And this wasn't uh, uh, debt restructuring. There, was a, uh, there were a couple of small debt restructurings prior to the period of interest, 2010 and 2012. Um, that are not uh, captured by this calculation. And there was something complicated and, and uh, uh, obscure about some debt owned, owed to Venezuela that was bought back by the Jamaican authorities. But you can see that, if anything, the stock flow adjustment goes the wrong way in this period. So how did Jamaica do it? Our answer comes in two parts. Part one. Jamaica adopted fiscal rules that increased fiscal transparency, encouraged formulation of a medium-term plan, and limited fiscal slippage. Element number two, elected officials leveraged a long-standing, hard-won tradition of consensus building, what we refer to in the paper as a system of, of democratic corporatism, an ideology of social partnership backed up by uh, uh, Im Im embedded in a set of centralized institutions where the social partners and others get together on a continuous basis um, with the goal of facilitating dialogue, limiting political instability, reducing political polarization and violence, monitoring the compliance of all the parties to the uh, agreement. Let me talk first about the fiscal rules and what they were. They really came in two parts. Part one came in 2010 with the so-called fiscal responsibility framework. The fi finance minister was required to take steps to, uh, by the end uh, of fiscal year 2016 to reduce the overall budget balance to zero, the debt to GDP ratio to 100%. Recall it started out over 150% and to limit the, uh, the growth of public sector wages. That framework was then strengthened in 2014 by putting in place the, the medium term fiscal trajectory requirement where the minister had to explain how he was going to continue to do this over time so as to bring the debt ratio down to 60% in 2026, pushed back to 2028 because of COVID. Um, and there, there was an escape clause included. Jamaica is subject to hurricanes, earthquakes, other natural disasters. So a very rigid fiscal rule wouldn't have been uh, 
credible. So they put in place a fiscal rule with an escape clause with numerical triggers to be monitored by an auditor general whose independence is guaranteed by the Constitution back to 1962. So th this is the way you would want to design an escape clause uh, or a fiscal rule, it seems to us. So I know the objection, that the, the first comment we would otherwise get, there are plenty of fiscal rules out there, and they all have thresholds of 60% for the debt-to-GDP ratio. Why would this one work when so many others haven't? And that's where element two really comes in, in our view, the, uh, the ideology of national partnerships. So starting in 2013, there were ongoing discussions within a formal national partnership council uh, involving the government, the parliamentary opposition, the social partners, um, culminating in a written agreement governing uh, policy in four areas. Area number one was fiscal reform and consolidation. Uh, and our view of that process is that it fostered a common belief that the burden of fiscal adjustment would be widely and fairly shared. So everybody talks about program ownership and nobody explains what they mean when they say ownership. This is program ownership. Um, and that then, that partnership agreement led to uh, a second uh, economic program oversight committee, another committee focused explicitly on fiscal and financial affairs, where the bankers and other financiers were overrepresented. This was something that where they had a lot at stake, where they worried about whether, whether the government and the social partners would keep to their agreement or not. They have continuously monitored uh, the program. They have taken booklets with its provisions from town to town to get the public on board. And, and uh, this has led to a more general decline in political polarization to a consensus about fiscal and financial policies. It's created a sense of fair burden sharing through this organized process of um, consultation. So even a dramatic change in, in, in government in 2016 didn't cause the, um, the fiscal program to be abandoned. Why, did, why is Jamaica exceptional? Uh, the next layer off the onion, if you will, would be to observe that Jamaica had a long history of for, forging such committees and social partnerships to deal with other Issues. So the first one was in 1979 around uh, uh, the credibility uh, of elections, that there had been all kinds of electoral violence and disputes over electoral outcomes. So in 1979, they formed an electoral advisory com commission structured in the way I, I, I've described the subsequent commissions with uh, government, opposition, social partners, NGOs, et cetera, to monitor elections and disseminate information about process and outcome. And that model was then transferred subsequently to a number of different other issue areas, finally to the financial and the budgetary, starting in 2010. So we understand the Jamaica exception in terms of Jamaica's history uh, of class division, political violence, racial tension that led to those electoral problems, but also highlighted the need for this kind of social partnership to move forward on an issue. And the last bullet point, as I run out of time, is alluding to leadership, starting with Michael Manley in the 19, 1980 or so, there was a more, there, there was a set of pragmatic leaders who put a lot of political and personal weight behind this approach. So the full story is more complex. There was sound management of the financial system, no banking crises in our period. Uh, the Jamaican authorities were clever in how they managed the term structure of the debt. There was this Venezuelan petro carib buyback, but we would argue that the central elements were the well-designed fiscal rule and the partnership agreement that lent ownership to that uh, program, and that the two elements were, were, were both critical. Neither of them would have worked without the other. So the final question then is, do any of these lessons carry over to other uh, 
countries, uh, that the list is so short that uh, m- makes one wonder that Jamaica's success flows from its distinctive earlier history, which is not obviously replicable elsewhere, similarly makes one wonder how generalizable uh, the lessons are. We have a long section toward the end of the paper where we look at a, at a couple of other small, open, shock-prone island, as it happens, economies that have similarly adopted fiscal rules and something that resembles democratic corporatism and brought their debts down um, quite successfully. Ireland in the 1980s, Barbados in the 1990s. So maybe that the, uh, the bottom line here is you have to look really hard to find other cases, but we, we could find at least uh, a couple. The other thing we would observe is that even if other countries do not have those same institutional and historical prerequisites, prerequisites in place. Jamaica's experience suggests that institutions can be malleable and that uh, they can be modified over time, not least through the creation and operation of encompassing institutional partnerships. Our first discussant is Laura Alfaro. Thank you very much to the organizers. I usually don't use my two last names. I don't know if you know, in Latin America, we have two last names. I didn't do what Andres Rodriguez Claire of hyphenized, of using a hyphen with my second last name because it's complicated. Um, it turns out my great grandfather, his name was really George Michael McFalder. And when he came to Costa Rica, someone decided that Michael was his last name, and they spell it like that. And the reason why I'm telling this story is because he came from Jamaica. And so I, I really appreciate it, uh, having the opportunity to read and discuss this amazing paper. But that also explains when there is a little bit of humility, my hair wants to be free. Uh, but well, anyways. So what does this... Um, paper do, so there are no bullets, eh, there's no animation, fine, there's no, it doesn't, it's, it's a PDF, oh, I see, okay, fine. Um, so the paper presents two empirical regularities. The first one is that these sharp sustained reductions in public debt are rare, are exceptional, especially recently, but the other one which the author stress is that it's even rarer once the emergency went away. Um, and then they highlight this amazing case of Jamaica when they did this reduction within a decade that is indeed exceptional. And they did it in Jamaica, they did it through a fiscal surpluses despite not having great um, interest rate a growth difference in their favor, and as the paper also mentions, more than their fair share of external shocks. And this, again, we know many ways in which you can reduce uh, debt to GDP ratios, and this comes from uh, Ken's paper with, with Carmen and Vincent. The usual, the nicest one, is if we get the right difference between growth and interest rates, then there is primary surplus, which is the way they did it, the old-fashioned way. Then there are the more heterodox measures, a inflation tax, but for that you need domestic local currency, not index, which is also not really what they did. Explicit default or restructuring, which is also not what they did, and they do go into the reasons why the bonds didn't have the right clauses, so on and so forth. And the last one is also financial repression, but usually that means you're, you're killing your local banks. And they also chose not to go uh, that way again. So it was the good old fashioned way. Um, why and how becomes then the questions of how you do this without the crisis on your neck. So it was a mixture of these fiscal rules, transparent, clear, flexible, within their framework that was amended uh, twice, I think I got the second date wrong, um, 
he had very clear monitoring, very clear reporting, and independent verification, an anchor in their history, their ownership, uh, that gave them ownership to what was being done, and then this very good relation where transparency meant that everyone felt that they were getting their first share and they were talking about it and then it allowed for continuity and they stressed this, the value of this reduced polarization that allowed to sustain the benefits beyond crisis, beyond changes in parties. And again, they do mention additional cases, Ireland, Barbados, Iceland, other cases that underscore this. And this is a, a figure from the table one, where I try to show the cases of excess uh, debt reduction. The way they do it is this largest five-year debt reduction. I try to plot them against uh, polarization in emerging markets, and you do see that most of them tend to be below the 25 percentile in terms of polarization. I also try to put which once had dead rules, and again, the definitions are so, somehow complicated, but some of the cases also had some form of fiscal rules. And so, I love this paper. First of all, we're going very heterodox. We have surveys and now cases. And of course, I love cases, because cases have been paying my mortgage for the last 25 years. So I do feel the pressure to sell them. But I actually do like when you get this in-depth um, description of how things work, because sometimes it's just very hard to get the proxy variables for all these complications of norms, political legacies, shared mental models, formal rules. Again, all of these that shapes the way we interact, the complexities of debt management, the internal logic, the consistency, but also the timing is always very hard to get. And, and indeed, this happened over 10 years. So, so it would be very hard for you to just find a very easy proxy for that. It's an excellent paper. It's very complete. I didn't know that when you send comments, they incorporated them. And so they send you back the paper even better with very detailed footnotes, like Take your time to read the footnotes. Everything you want to know is in a footnote. So it's actually a very hard paper to comment. Uh, so I'm going to have some broad thoughts on fiscal rules, ownership, polarization, and then end with a question uh, to the authors related to this high debt uh, world. So uh, I, bringing down high debt levels, I think there is value. There is value in emerging markets related to debt sustainability. We do know default is costly. I have a paper with this, on this, but Enrique Mendoza with uh, UA have shown that this is, there is a cost. We cannot sustain, we, we cannot make rationalize our, the debt levels in emerging markets without this additional default cost. So it is costly. It also gets in the way of implementing counter-cyclical fiscal policy. Again, because there's the fear of default, they start asking for high interest rates, and the whole thing go down, goes down the drain. Fiscal dominance, debt overhang, crowding out, there are many reasons. So there is a value on reducing this debt. But as we know, again, from emerging markets, when it rains, it pours even more in the tropics, even more in the Caribbean, they get hurricanes, as the paper describes. So then we have come up with fiscal rules a way to try to correct some weird incentive that is creating this excess uh, debt. A political economy, heterogeneity, war of attrition, common pool, there, there are many reasons, that, and you have papers on this as well, or at least Pierre Garrett, that I think is also with you, yes, um, that, that are trying to rationalize why are we getting these uh, biases. And so I took this, I learned this line from the Federalist paper a long ago, also teaching about the U.S. Constitution, a case that I thought was great. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, fine, uh, <laughs> the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the government and the next place oblige it to control itself. Thus, fiscal rules. They have been there since the 80s. All of a sudden, they have grown. And there are many types. Debt, deficit, revenue, expenditures. Again, this also comes from the IMF that has plot. 
and uh, give us information on this. Why? Why do we need commitment? Why is the government being so impatient? Again, this is the overall debate on debt uh, rules versus discretion. Are they quantitatively good for the country? Do they increase welfare? And so I have a paper that we have tried to do this, to try to look at the welfare implications of that rules. And the way we use as a trick to try to get into these incentives is their quasi-hyperbolic uh, preferences. Again, people have done this, this trick, if you want, to try to think of why you would need and it would make sense to have some form of fiscal rule. And what we find calibrating it to Brazil, uh, where we do manage to get the debt levels, is that the optimal debt rule does increase welfare. Uh, if you do something simpler than the more complex uh, optimal rule, that also improves welfare, again, the, relative to no rule. But not all rules improve welfare. In particular, very restrictive rules don't, and I think this is a great lesson from um, Jamaica. It has to be structured the right way. I don't know if you know this, they have become like an example. I was an IDB a summit and everyone wants to do what Jamaica is doing. I, I, I'm like, I was not supposed to say anything because the paper was, didn't allow us, but, I, but, but I, it was also shocking to me that I didn't know that it has become an example, that countries are trying to do this. Now, we calibrated to Brazil, which is of course large and not an island, but it's still interesting because a Dilma's impeachment in 2016, the president, was due to not complying to the fiscal rule. Then in 2016, they actually changed to make it stronger. And I know this because my husband was behind that. So I know the process of how this was done. And then he still wakes up in the middle of the night crying because they got rid of it during COVID. <laughs> Is commitment effective? And then we go to another quote that I got from teaching. The spirit of the people, its cultural level, its social structure, that this is policy may prepare. All of this and more is written in the fiscal history, uh, Schumpeter. Then we go to that beautiful part of this paper that explains it how they did it. And then you do go to the spirit of the people. And you see how it's very complex, very same reinforcing, the institutions, organization, how increase transparency, reduce polarization, allow to monitor better rules. Again, the case of Brazil didn't happen like this. It was chaos. They went and they got the votes, but there was no ownership for that. And indeed, they changed it very quickly, and there were no contingencies. Then again, Brazil doesn't have hurricanes or, or earthquakes to make it clear uh, contingencies, but the fiscal rule didn't have it. Having said that, we know it's not simple. Um, even in the cases where, for example, Costa Rica, I think we used to be very cohesive. We're not anymore. We have all the institutionals that you mentioned. Something happened, leadership happened. Uh, but, but again, and we're not an island. But again, there is this internal consistency and cohesiveness that is so hard to explain, and when it breaks, it's also sometimes very hard to rebuild. But there are examples, again, Ireland, Iceland, and Barbados, where they managed to uh, make it work. And so then we go to this beautiful part of the role of polarization. It turns out that the literature on this is a little bit more mixed. The theory is actually depends on the form of polarization, the heterogeneity, the type of conflict, preferences, uh, and again, different papers will give you that polarization gives you to more spending, but others it depends on preferences or depends, and there are even some that actually leads to lower. So again, it's complex, it's nonlinear. I think that paper does show the role of, of these variables. If you try to do a little bit of econometrics, the first thing that you find is that the debt and the fiscal variables are complex. I, I did email them, like, what, what was the variable you used to try to get the series? It's very hard to get comparable series because countries have different forms of government and they include different things. The other thing is when you're in the trenches, the data available is not the data that eventually appears in the IMF, IFS. That's, that's the other. But you do get, if you're kind, some of the relations of the paper, uh, more polarization gives more debt, 
and a more less polarization, more fiscal surpluses. But again, it's, you have to be kind a little bit with the data, but you do get it in the cases that they're uh, doing. I, I, this is fiscal surpluses. Uh, they do uh, that. And you do see that in these cases, that was the way that uh, it worked, uh, less polarization, more circa, fiscal surpluses. Having said that, the paper does have a very pessimistic view of the U.S. And when you look at the data and what's going on, I share their view. But not only for the U.S., more generally, a interest rates are increasing, the payments are increasing, but the world has become also more polarized, um, not only internationally, but I think also within countries. And so I end with this question for the authors, the only question they didn't answer from all the ones I sent. What can we say, what are the lessons for international financial institutions of how to deal with this? It turns out that the one variable that tends to be very significant is if you do ITIPC, but one of the authors does have a paper that uh, does show that the outcomes of those are also not very encouraging in terms of growth. But to end, as always, I must read paper. Thanks. Our second discussion is Emil Werner. All right, well, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this uh, fascinating uh, paper. So Barry, I think, summarized it very nicely, but let me just give you kind of the brief overview. So the paper is about this large uh, public debt to GDP reduction in Jamaica from about 140% of GDP in 2012 to 77% in 2022. And they find that the reduction was achieved through these very large sustained primary surpluses of, in many years, over 7.5% of GDP. And as Laura said, you know, the paper has very careful, detailed narrative discussion of exactly how these large primary surpluses were sustained. And there's two components. The first is there are fiscal rules that were credible, stringent, but also not overly rigid so that they allowed for escape clauses if, for example, there was a natural disaster or a big economic uh, downturn, and that made them more credible. And then the second piece was consensus building that fostered the belief that the burden of the adjustment would be fairly shared uh, across the population. So in my comments, I'm going to focus on two, two points. First, I'm going to get a little bit more into the mechanics, trying to understand how Jamaica uh, did it and what changed after 2013. And then second, I'm going to try to compare Jamaica to other large debt reductions to see you know, if it's similar or, or different. So first, if you look at how, how Jamaica did it, uh, Barry showed this figure here of public debt to GDP uh, ratio, and what you see is that around 2012, 2013, that's when the debt to GDP ratio starts, starts going down. If I plot the primary surpluses to GDP, uh, they're here on the right axis, you see that large primary surpluses were indeed sustained during this period. But what you also see that's a little bit of a mystery at first is that actually the primary surpluses were already large before 2012. In the early 2000s, you have primary surpluses of 8, 10% of GDP, and sometimes debt actually uh, goes up as a share of, of GDP. So this got me thinking, you know, what happened after 2012? Um, so the paper has this very nice debt dynamics decomposition, and I'll try to extend it back to 2006. Uh, so the way this works is on the left-hand side, you have the change in the government debt to GDP ratio, and then we decompose that into the primary deficit to GDP ratio, the real interest rate versus real growth rate effect, so R minus G, and then two terms that are related to uh, foreign currency debt and exchange rate depreciation. So the first term, the Z times A term, that's the effects of real depreciations, uh, and the second term, this P minus P star term, that's the effect of relative inflation uh, in Jamaica compared to uh, the US, given that most debt is in US dollars. And then the last term is the stock flow adjustment or, or residual, which picks up sort of other factors that can change the debt to GDP ratio. So when I do this exercise, here first I'm showing you roughly what's figure seven uh, in the paper. I was, I think, able to replicate it quite well, though not, not perfectly. And what you see is, indeed, it's these large primary deficits that are explaining the fall uh, in, the, in the debt to GDP ratio that's in uh, the blue line there. What you also see is 
the residuals are quite large in some years. So 2015, that was the buyback of this Venezuelan petro caribe debt that actually lowered the debt-to-GDP ratio by, by 10%. Um, and before that, in, for example, 2013, 2014, the residual is positive, um, which reflects the realization of some contingent liabilities that's described very clearly in the paper. What you also see is that you know, the real interest rate and the real growth rate, they also matter, but these, these are smaller components. Okay, if you extend this back in time, what you see is that, not surprisingly, the blue bars are still very negative and very large because the primary surpluses were large already before when debt started uh, going down. But nevertheless, debt actually is stable and high or even growing during this period. So why is that? Well, you can see uh, you know, one important component in some years is the foreign currency debt and exchange rate depreciation. So especially in 2009, what you see is, if you look here, kind of green bars, uh, that shows you the real exchange rate effect. And the purple is the relative, in, relative inflation. Um, and so that's pushing up the debt, debt to GDP ratio. Uh, and 2009 is obviously a bad year for those dynamics. But the other term that really jumps out at you is this residual, which is sort of the unexplained uh, piece and, and, and in a way is a little bit of a mystery. We don't like things that are unexplained. Um, and so I think this sort of nuances the story a little bit of how Jamaica managed to reduce its debt to GDP ratio starting in 2013. Um, so first, to some extent, primary surpluses actually do go up uh, after, the cri after the global financial crisis to 2013. Um, and the primary surpluses uh, you know, were higher after 2013 compared to, for example, 2011. Um, but you know, they are already large in the 2000s. Second, the R minus G term, that's pretty stable. It doesn't matter too much. Foreign currency debt matters in some years, but it's pretty similar in the pre and post period. So we want to kind of know what's in this residual. And you know, I've never read as many IMF documents in you know, three days that I, I did over the past week. I tried to figure out what, what it is, and it seems to be stuff that you know, uh, it, it can be hard to understand. So a lot of it is stuff like <laughs> extra budgetary expenditures, uh, the realization of contingent liabilities. So the, the, the financial crisis in the late, uh, mid, late 1990s led to the realization of a lot of contingent liabilities that show up in public debt. Uh, in the early and mid-2000s. Mid and then I think the other part is losses on state-owned enterprises. And the, the paper also uh, men mentions this. It seems that state-owned enterprises were you know, much more poorly run in the 2000s than they, be than they became later. And that seems to actually you know, matter, and, and, and this is a big number. So this sort of makes me think, one is kind of a measurement point. Well, maybe you know, these data are obviously hard, hard, hard to analyze. Maybe the surpluses are really overstated in, in the 2000s. But I think actually really understanding these issues is important for getting the story right, because this is the main component that changed around when these fiscal rules were implemented uh, and when this consensus building and epoch component um, you know, was introduced around 2010, 2013. So perhaps there's kind of more to the, the, to the kind of more fiscal consolidation than the paper really sort of uh, argues. And the fiscal consolidation happens by effectively you know, reducing all of these slippages that end up showing up that are not in the primary surplus, but that end up affecting and pushing up the debt to GDP ratio. Okay, so the second uh, question I had that when you read the paper and you know, Barry already uh, alluded to is, how does this compare in an international uh, perspective? There aren't so many episodes of sustained debt to GDP uh, reductions, um, but there are some, especially if you're willing to go further back in time, and especially also if you're willing to consider advanced economies and emerging markets. So what I did is I looked for episodes when there's at least a 20 percentage point reduction in the government debt to GDP ratio, inspired by table one uh, in, in, the, in the paper that Laura also mentioned. Um, and uh, there what you look for is times when the country was able to reduce its debt to GDP ratio by 20 percent uh, percentage points over a five year period. So it has to be sustained. And then I do you, you do your best? I do my best to try to get rid of these episodes that are accompanied by defaults or haircuts. So these have to be episodes where the debt is actually somehow uh, paid off or reduced relative to GDP, but not through default or repudiation. So it turns, up if you, it turns out if you use the WIO database, you end up with about 40 episodes, 38 episodes with complete data coverage where you have the sustained debt to GDP ratio uh, reduction. This is both for advanced economies and emerging markets starting in 1990. 
Then uh, I'll also consider six emerging market uh, episodes that are listed in Table 1 in, in the paper that have complete uh, da data coverage. So what do these look like, uh, and how does this compare to Jamaica? So Jamaica is in you know, Jamaican colors of, of uh, 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 green and yellow. Uh, the large debt reductions are in blue. This is for the sample of 38 debt reductions. And then the specific emerging markets after 2000 that are mentioned in Table 1, they're in the light blue uh, dashed line. And so you see in terms of the change in government debt to GDP, you know, by design, these other episodes also have the sustained reduction in the debt to GDP ratio. And Jamaica is sort of you know, even more impressive compared to these, uh, these other episodes. But if you look at how Jamaica did it compared to other countries, it really is different. So uh, in the top left, I'm plotting real GDP growth on average in event time around these episodes. And so you see for the large debt reductions, the, the solid blue line, GDP on average was quite good during these episodes. Of. So averages, you know, 3, 4, even 5% of GDP. Whereas, as Barry mentioned, Jamaica had GDP growth of less than 1%, uh, 1 and during most of this period. The real interest rate term is sort of uh, similar, but when you combine the R and the G term, the R minus G is very, the dynamics are very different for, for Jamaica. So most of these other countries, they reduce the debt, debt to GDP ratio, uh, you know, uh, uh, through growth, uh, essentially, uh, whereas Jamaica did it through primary surpluses. And you see that these primary surpluses in the bottom right for Jamaica you know, are much higher than the average sustained debt reduction, which makes really, you know, Jamaica qu quite an exceptional uh, case. In fact, I tried to figure out how exceptional was Jamaica. So this is sort of the World Cup uh, of primary surpluses. Uh, so this is the ranking year by year of, of, of primary surpluses across countries. And what you see, for example, say take 2016, a year when Jamaica had a big uh, debt to GDP reduction. It ranked sixth in the world, only surpassed by Kiribati, Tuvalu, Iceland, Dominica, and Macau. I forgave myself for not being able to find all of these countries uh, on a map. The average population is 250,000 uh, for these countries. So J Jamaica is, is, is really exceptional in terms of, of the primary surpluses that it was able uh, to run. And so in the back of my mind, this question that I had, you know, reading the paper is, how do you sustain these primary surpluses? You know, how do you uh, make sure essentially that the, the public the population doesn't revolt, doesn't get fed up, doesn't want to you know, take some other... Uh, course doesn't want to go for, for, for repudiation. And I think here the story of uh, the al having the burden of adjustment allocated uh, across society in a fair way that doesn't put hardship, especially on, on the poorest and most vulnerable, actually also shows up in, in the data. So if you look, for example, at the unemployment rate, um, while growth in Jamaica wasn't very strong, actually when, when this debt, debt reduction starts, Jamaica is kind of is, 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 has very high unemployment, about 15%. Um, but even though growth isn't so high, unemployment rate is actually coming, uh, coming, coming down. If you look at other measures like poverty rates reported by uh, the uh, Jamaican Statistical Institute, you see that actually poverty rates, if anything, go down during this period. And inequality measured by the, the Gini coefficient also uh, uh, goes down a little bit. So I think that's sort of consistent with this idea that you can only you know, do this if you really ensure uh, that these sort of measures of, of, of the social indicators and measures of you know, how people are doing in society, in, in, including uh, the worse off, uh, actually you know, doesn't deteriorate too much or maybe even uh, improves. Um, so again, it's a fascinating paper. I encourage you uh, to read it. It's really a remarkable episode of sustained debt reduction. I think understanding better exactly the fiscal consolidation and how all of these sort of fiscal slippages were, uh, were removed is very important. The IMF's uh, World Economic Outlook uh, chap uh, chapter from last year actually also touched on uh, Jamaica, and they, they, they also talk about fiscal consolidation having been uh, quite important. So I think that's, that, uh, that's consistent with what I'm saying here. And then the second message is this is really an exceptional case in terms of running these large primary surpluses. That doesn't seem to be how most countries have reduced debt to GDP ratios in a sustained way since 1990. Thank you. Okay, so let me open it up for questions and comments. So I'd like to understand a little bit better where these primary surpluses come from. 
whether do they have really high taxes on certain parts of the population or on everybody compared to other countries, or are there certain areas of government spending that Jamaica doesn't do that other countries do? Um, that's my question. Raghu? Yeah, just amplifying on that one, do they raise taxes on the rich at the same time as they uh, you know, spend a little on this side? What, what are they doing to spread the burden? And how do you have unemployment coming down so much when uh, growth is so tepid? So, I mean, the details would be great. What, what's really going on? David? Yes, I have a slightly long clarifying question trying to understand the, the consensus building and, and how that worked. So I, I want to think of the following thought experiment. I want to take um, Bernie Sanders or George W. Bush and make them Jamaican and have them run on a platform either of, we're running these surpluses, it's the people's money, I'm going to give it back to them, uh, or we have all these needs, we have all this money that we're currently using to pay back money borrowed by the 1% of the 1%, I'm going to spend it on various social programs. What would happen to that politician? Why would they not cruise, cruise to victory? Would they not somehow make it onto the ballot because it's not an open primary system like in the US, it's more like a British model? Would they really just go down in flames at the polls from people saying, no, we have this consensus to all suffer to make this good? Or the rule so strong that they couldn't, couldn't implement it? it. And uh, the, 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 the parallel, I had a similar conversation uh, with somebody from Chile about 15 years ago about their wonderfully responsible fiscal policy when they said, well, we could, of course, a populist leader could, could never get elected in, in Chile. Now, my, my quick check with Maury says that although Chile does have a populist leader, uh, it doesn't have, it hasn't repudiated fiscal responsibility yet, but it seems like they're kind of on that path potentially somewhat. So it seems like, say that again. Okay, so so uh, okay, so that case suggests that uh, some of these things may be more vulnerable than one thinks. But I, I would just like to 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 sort of just have your thoughts about what what would happen to my uh, George Bush or Bernie Sanders. Tristan. Thanks. Um, I, I just want to you know. When I learned development macro in grad school, we learned that institutions were the fundamental long run cause of fundamental cause of long run growth. And here you show that institutions are the fundamental cause of fiscal responsibility. And so I'm wondering why, in the Jamaican case, did you not get a lot of economic growth? Does that show that you know geography or hurricanes is more important than maybe we were taught? Wait. Yeah, j just some quantification of the uh, benefits that the financial markets have, have regaled on Jamaica as a result of this. I, I noticed that, uh, for example, uh, they just recently issued debt in their own currency. So that maybe is an example. But how much lower are the spreads that are paying on the dollar-denominated debt? And how, how large of a wealth effect has that been for the country? And on the other, on the other side of the capital account, um, you know, we see government saving going up, but is private sector external borrowing going up? because of credibility effects or something. Steve? Uh, hi. Uh, very interesting paper. I'm trying to understand a little bit more about where the consensus on fiscal consolidation came from. Ordinarily, uh, it takes a profound financial or economic crisis uh, to move society uh, you know, toward accepting uh, you know, budget uh, consolidation. Um, in this case, that the primary surpluses seem to precede 2013, uh, and in any event, it was a little bit unclear exactly what forced society and the government uh, to make those um, adjustments. And then finally, considering that, um, that subsequent GDP growth was very weak for the decade, more or less, following uh, 20, you know, 2010, uh, it kind of makes one wonder whether they really needed to do that consolidation to that extent in the first place. Ken? Yeah, I just want uh, also wanted to ask a little more about the history. Um, so obviously Germany's very anti-inflation, but that was fueled by having horrible inflation. 
And I'm vaguely remembering, and I apologize, I didn't look before, but you know, Jamaica had been you know exceptionally badly run, and uh, even when Manley came in, I think it, I, I thought there was a long transition. Wasn't he at war with the IMF uh, for a while and such? So maybe you could it partly answers these questions, or you could expand on that. Jan Maria. Yeah, just to provide that tiny bit of color on this, and I was the IMF reviewer of the program, and we have actually the mission chief uh, that, of the program that started this adjustment right there. Um, and I can say that the, just the start was, a red, was very difficult. We, what was highlighted here was the political economy in Jamaica. It was a complicated political economy in getting the loan out because Jamaica had a pretty bad track record of keeping IMF programs on track, and hence there was a lot of in-house resistance to um, a large program, large by the size of Jamaica. And the second is the relation with other, you know, it was not just the IMF as to act as a catalyst. You had to, to, to get the World Bank and the IDB on board, and those negotiations were also quite, quite fraught. And uh, uh, so the odds of this succeeding ex ante were, I would say, quite, uh, quite low. Uh, and we always talk about the commitment and ownership, and I think it is the right, the right approach. Uh, but it was very hard ex ante to predict that this would stick, all the more so if you knew that the government would eventually lose power three years into, into the program. So I, I think... Uh, you know, the drawing lessons is, is, is important, but it is just very hard to think that all the stars were aligned from the beginning. This was a very difficult situation, and I think, again, the policymakers deserve a lot of credit for, for sticking to things, uh, all the more so since growth was low. And just one small additional point on growth, we always think of R minus G as the channel through which growth affects debt, but there is also the primary balance. So when you have weak growth, keeping you know tax revenues are lower, so this makes the effort all the more extraordinary. Okay, so I think there's a lot of demand for you know more details from the author. I'm going to bring it back to the authors. So thank you for all the questions. I won't respond to all of them, but let me try to respond in a, in a holistic way. Starting with the question of um, institutions and impact on growth. So one of the things which motivated the paper was, so Conrad Miller and I wrote a paper in 2009 called Institutions versus Policies, Tale of Two Islands, that we published in the May issue of the American Economic Review Papers and Proceedings, where we basically showed that the policy choices, getting to Ken's question, the policy choices that Michael Manley made when he was elected in 1972 um, had a Devastating impact on the Jamaican economy. The Jamaican economy, starting in 1973, contracted every year for 13 straight years. And the really important point about that is all of those the policy decisions, whether it was to engage in uh, spending that rose from about 20% of GDP to 45% of GDP government spending, closing down the economy to all sorts of exports, exchange controls, and just continue to go through the list of things that countries shouldn't do, generated this tremendous uh, contraction in GDP. It was in response to coming out of 1962 when Jamaica became an independent country. There was a boom in the 60s because Jamaica was doing very well uh, producing bauxite, but there was dramatic inequality that was exacerbated. And so Manley came to power wanting to address those inequalities, but doing it instead of harnessing the market economy by implementing a bunch of dirigist policy, pol policies, but very importantly, policies that were implemented under Westminster parliamentary democracy. And so the point about comparing, comparing Jamaica and Barbados is that Jamaica went into this dramatic decline because of the policy choices that were made in the same democratic institutional framework that Barbados, but Barbados had. And so you get these, so, so the question then, it's Steve, Steve Cavan's question about crises. I mean, Jamaica had sort of this, was in serial crisis for essentially, call it 40 years. 
from 1972 to, uh, to the time when the, de the debt turnaround happened. Uh, GDP per capita in Jamaica today is still not quite where it was in 1972. So Jamaica had 12, uh, I think if I counted correctly, straight failed IMF engagements prior to the successful engagement in 2013, which is what John Maria was, was, was referring to. So many uh, failures, in fact, that just to be quite frank, when Jamaica tried to go to the IMF in, in 2012, when the new, uh, new administration came in, following some events that we talked about in the paper, when the, uh, the fiscal responsibility framework went off track, no one, wanted, no one returned the calls. Uh, and so, so that was, that was, so, so that's, that, that was, the, that was the, the, the crisis. But then going back to this deeper question, the history, Right, so as you can imagine, if GDP contracts for 13 straight years in a middle income country that already had a history of some polarization, it's not a happy time. Okay, so uh, in 19, and this, and this is what Barry talked about this, so the, the Electoral Advisory Commission came about in 1979 because, you know, Manley, after his first term in 1976, GDP is continuing to, to, to drop. He gets elected again by basically playing populist politics. He says there's no room in Jamaica for people who want to be millionaires. So he was kind of attacking business. And people took him at his word, and they left the country, <laughs> including my parents. You know, and, the, and then the economy continued to decline. And so, so the point of that is in, 19, in, in the run-up to the 1980 election, because the stakes were so high, in terms of sort of whether the PNP, the People's National Party, the JLP, the Jamaican Labor Party got elected, right? The perception within what you call political garrisons within the country were, were so high that people were killing each other if they, if they perceived them to be supporters of the other party. There were 800 murders in the run-up to the 1980 election. And so, and so the 1979 Electoral uh, Advisory Commission was set up to try to address this issue. And even a Peace, Hope, Love concert by Bob Marley in 1979 couldn't stop the violence. Right? And so the acceptance of this electoral advisory commission, and then slowly over time, they begin to have the social partnership, these social partnerships to address these issues because the country's on the brink. They don't do something, the country's gonna just fall apart. So people, so, so kind of fast forward then to 2013, when Barry talked about the economic policy oversight committee that get, gets get set up. Why do, you, you know, why do, you know, why do, why do, the, why do the workers agree to, to let the bankers monitor the program. Well, the finance minister, Mr. Peter Phillips, was approached by the bankers who say, we're not gonna agree to another restructuring unless you let us monitor the program. He says, fine, I don't have a problem with you doing that. He's a PhD, and so he has a PhD in sociology, understands the history. So he's got kind of an off-the-shelf model he can pull. And basically, I'm gonna, I'm gonna include the unions and, and I'm gonna include uh, civil society in this, in this conversation, because we have these, these models that Barry talked about starting with the Electoral Advisory Commission, the National Planning Council in 1988, very importantly when Manley came back to power, uh, to Barry's point, and basically embraced a more moderate approach to policy formulation. And so then you just had the, then you had the National Planning Council, there's the National Planning Council, the National Partnership Council, and so on and so forth. And so Peter Phillips has this history he can point to, say, hey, we're gonna form the single economic policy oversight committee based on these, uh, these, uh, these uh, partnership groups you've had in the past, and people actually embrace it. Why do they, why do they embrace it even then? Because they know how bad it can get if, if there's no cohesion, because they've, they, they, they remember, they remember all, the, all the political killings. Um, so that's, there's, there's, there are more details in the paper, just very quickly on spending and taxes. It was mostly a mostly spending reduction. There were some small tax increases, um, but, um, Still lots, still, lots, still lots of challenges, but that's, that's a fairly quick summary of a pretty detailed history that's in the paper. I encourage you to, to, read, to read, read further for more, for more details. Out of barrier, sir, I want to add anything. So we had a, a set of questions about timing that really cannot be answered. Uh, why did uh, primary surpluses begin to emerge around uh, 2005, 2006? Why did uh, fiscal per performance improve further around 2013? Well, the debt was exploding already in, in the mid-aughts, 
um, and it then rose by another 20 percentage points of GDP between uh, two, 2005 and 2013 when our period, if you will, uh, begins. So there was the perception of a debt problem. There was a recollection of a, of a major banking and financial crisis in the second half of the 1990s when a credit boom and accumulating debt had brought down the entire banking system and uh, uh, prompting a very expensive government bailout of the banks. So they wanted to preempt that as well. That memory was, was very live. Finally, um, I, I, I think we need to take on, on board Emil's point about uh, the actual underlying budget surplus prior to 2013 being a bit smaller than shown by the headline figures. Uh, the calculations that, that we have, have feverishly been doing since uh, the, the four of us started talking earlier suggest that um, uh, the uh, debt increased between 2006 and 2013, half because of unfavorable R minus G and real depreciation, which increased the value of the external dollar denominated debt, and half because of hidden government spending on what they call um, state bodies, which are parastatals, basically. Um, and, and, and one of the things that the 2013 fiscal rule reform did was it brought that hidden spending to the surface where, where it could be seen and where it was compressed, and that, that's part of what happened subsequently. So that story, I think, is, is compatible with our emphasis on the importance of the fiscal rule and fiscal transparency and so forth. All right, thank you. So we'll break now, and those of you that registered for the cocktail hour and dinner, that starts at 6, and it's over at the uh, DuPont Circle Hotel. So see you then. <laughs>